I think that is one of the biggest things that describes how I've kind of gone my, my career about volleyball is, dude, I soak up everything about this game. I have the the RAM, if you will, up, up top to understand the different parts of the game. And, and so then the, I pick up a lot of the, the game IQ from just watching and learning. Tallest podcast on earth. Welcome back. I took a little bit of a hiatus because um, the holidays hit me hard, dude. But now I'm back and I'm not just back. We're better because we got Tijon Mustard Man DeFalco here with us today. Um, TJ, I'm, I'm so happy. And just to be clear, TJ and I tried to do a podcast when we played together last year and we learned a lot of valuable lessons. <laughs> <laughs> Did not go to plan. No, it didn't. Uh, and in fact, I mean, the biggest problem we were we were trying to do it live in person, but like I'd talk and you could hear it in your headphones, and then you would talk and you could hear it in mine, and it was just like this crazy like echo chamber. It was gnarly. Yeah, it was just a recipe for bad bad outcomes. It was terrible. Yeah, but did it not was have the proper equipment. No, we did not. And now look at us. Look at us, dude. We're both we're both thriving. We're thriving maybe more when we're separate. You know. Oh, dude. I don't mean that at all. I don't mean that. At all. I don't even know why. I don't even know why I said that, dude. I don't even know why I said that. Here, I'm, well, I'm getting just... distracted. TJ, dude, I'm so stoked to have you. Um, first of all, I just want to I want to give you a little bit of love right off the bat. Um, you know, when we first started playing together, uh, I didn't like you. I didn't know you, and I didn't really like you. You know, like before, and in fact, I'll never forget hearing that you and I were going to play together in Olshton. And I was like, oh God, I got the, I got TJ, dude. This kid's like a wild card. Like I didn't know you at all, you know? And we never like on the national team, we were never like buds and hanging out and we just, you know, doing our thing. You're not, you're a nice guy, obviously, but you know, I just was like, I don't know if we're going to get along. Um, and dude, you literally of any teammate I've ever judged before I knew them, you were the biggest surprise I think I've ever had as a teammate. Like you were just such a good, uh, loyal friend and human being. And I am just so grateful for the time we got to have. I think you and I became really close and that was just such a surprise to me. You know, I just really wasn't sure what to expect. And I'd heard stories and I'm sure you'd heard stories of me. We both were definitely wild boys in college. Like I knew we would have some things in common, you know, but like, um, yeah, I just wanted to say, dude, you were just such a surprise and I love you dearly. So. Dude, I love that. And, uh, and that, I'm sure we'll get into it, whatever, but that's one of the biggest things, um, uh, you know, the, the cliche saying about judging a book before, uh, judging a book by the cover, you know, that's, you hear the stories, you don't really know what the heck to, to think. And then all of a sudden you get into the person it's like, dude, that was all just a bucket of horseshit that people were telling me to need in my ears and all this stuff. It's like, find out for yourself, you know, you might, you might be a little surprised. And that's what the case, I'm really happy that that was the case that turned out. And I'm uh, really, it makes my heart warm to hear that. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I totally agree. And I think what it also told, what it also taught me is like, people's character on the court and who they are off the court what it reminded me like getting to know you off the court is that we're all human beings you know and I think sometimes we see players and I'm like oh that guy looks cocky or like and and we're gonna get into some of this stuff with you that just like you've been a baller for a long time and I think that comes with a different responsibility but just not knowing you and being like oh this guy's like you know, kind of can do what he wants because he's so good. And like, I, you didn't, you're such a, uh, on the court, you have such a like aggressive personality because you're fucking good, first of all. And second of all, like, you know, you, uh, you play with a lot of passion. And I think uh, sometimes for me, like I could see it as, I saw it as something that was maybe like more than just who you were on the court. And then getting to know you off the court, it was like, oh, you can tell, and I'm excited to dive in a little bit of your history, like the way you were raised, it's just like, you're just a good old country boy, you know? <laughs> like so many of those qualities that I think are stereotypical as a kid from the suburbs of California, it's like, you know, just like loyal and hardworking and just like about family and those things that, um, you know, I had no idea about you. And they were just like such a warm surprise for me. 
yeah. it inspired me. You, you really did inspire me that last year. Um, in some ways, I hated you, and in other ways, you inspired me, and I, that's why I love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know exactly uh, the the give and take, the yin and yang of that situation. <laughs> um, okay, so I do I do want to get into a little bit of just your history growing up because I think your story growing up is like fascinating to me. You know, so mm. I um, I would love it if you would talk a little bit just about like. Uh, TJ at birth until, you know, TJ finds volleyball, like just that, what it was like for you growing up, because you grew up like uh, Tarzan, it sounds like. Yeah, well, I mean, as close as you can get. Uh, uh, so I grew up, um, was home birthed in a 500 gallon water tank um, on a farm about 250 acres in the middle of nowhere, about an hour from the nearest town of population of about 50 people like it was that far out in the middle of the boonies and nowhere <clears throat> and so one of the wait when you the say 500 gallon float tank or tank what, what do you I, it's hard for me to picture 500 gallons like how big is it like a small swimming pool uh yeah so like you, you know those like small inflatable pools that you go maybe it's like five feet in diameter okay it's like that but it's like uh, industrial plastic and it's maybe three feet tall and it's for, it's for watering cattle and like livestock. Oh my God. So it's not, it wasn't like you guys bought it just to give birth to TJ. It's like you had it for the animals you had on a farm. Yeah. Legend. So it was, uh, we had a heater in there and, and the whole point of, of a water birth was to allow the embryo to go to a aqua state in the, in the, the sack and the egg or whatever it's called. Um, into another aquaceous state and like a smooth transition to where the it's it's like like i guess the only way is to like have a smooth transition so the water is the same temperature as the body inside the body and everything like that so it's the and it's warmed and everything and so that was the kind of the point of that um and yeah it, it was a lot of done a lot of research by my dad and uh the most homeopathic um safe and natural try to way to have a have a birth so your and family's so, your family's really like homopathic 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 is that no. <laughs> homeopathic right. homeopathic <laughs> You're, so what i'm trying to say is you come from a pretty holistic family then yeah exactly yeah. um because my dad uh had, his father was a uh, pastor catholic real real heavy on the religion side mm. and he was able to experience that and understand that that wasn't his that was not really what he wanted to do. So he decided to take things on in, into his own hands and learn about all of the, the different religions, take some pieces here and there from different things and, and decided that <clears throat> for whatever reasons that he wasn't a big fan of a lot of the stuff in the religion uh, textbook and scripts and all this stuff. Uh, so he did his own research and, and that's when he started doing a lot of research on all the, the medicine stuff, the medicine side, because well, I think one of the reasons was because we were so far from everything it wasn't in immediate access to a hospital or medical professional or anything like that. Mm. So he started doing all the research on his own to be able to support his family for whenever certain things aro arose, mm. you know, whether it be a snake bite on the farm, someone whose legs gets, uh, you know, uh, kicked by an emu and shredded. What are you going to do about it? You're going to drive three hours to the nearest hospital. You're going to, you know, you're going to fucking take it by the balls. And figure whoa, out whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean kicked by an emu, bro? <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, my brother had an accident when he was younger because we had a bunch of emu on the farm. Wait, I mean, like, what do, what do emu do? Or I, when I think of emu, I think of like, I don't know, dude, like uh, some Sahara. I don't even know. That's why I'm an idiot. But I just mean like, I do not think of like, e like you have an emu because they serve some purpose on your farm. Like, what do they do? Would you eat their eggs or something? You eat their eggs and you also harvest their, their meat. Their, their uh, emu steaks are incredibly tender and very valuable well i've never had one before what it taste <clears> like um better better than a good cut of steak very tender not very lean and you're so trying to it, tell me that andrea's tomahawk isn't as good as an emu steak i said some cuts of beef all right all right, all right. but the, you, the, you, you'd the, compare it more to like a cattle than you would to like i don't know chicken or duck or something no yeah it's it's a red meat Okay. And it's not a, it's not a poultry. It's a, it's a red meat and we would make 
you know, steaks, we would make bacon, we would make, uh, we would, you know, hide, dehydrate it and make jerky. We would do all, all kinds of stuff with it because <clears throat> I don't know if you know, if they're like 800 pounds, 1100 pounds. Dude, they're actually terrifying. In fact, remember the, uh, when you and I, and those for you who don't know, TJ and I played together last year in Poland on a team called Olsten, where I'm at now. And uh, one of the hotels we had to stay at because of a sponsor, they had emus there. Yeah. And they're uh, big birds. They're big birds, dude. And those were babies compared to the ones we had at the farm. Really? Did you, can you ride them? Could you ride them as a no, kid? That, no, 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 no. You know what very... makes you think of? Those Halloween costumes. You see those Halloween costumes that like blow up ones where you can like look yeah. like you're riding an emu? Those are so sick. <laughs> All right, so you can't, you, can't ride, you can't ride them then or chose not to. Um, but they got, they got those talons, bro, right? They got big talons. On the back of their leg, yeah. Yeah. And that's that because they they obviously they don't have any arms they have wings and anything like that so their defense mechanism is kicking, mm. and they were they're very protective and very aggressive and so my brother was in the in the pen feeding them and doing all this stuff and good. I don't know if he was being stupid or whatever what happened but he got got too close to one of them and it, and it kicked him and it shredded his leg. What'd you do? Like, well, my dad had to sit there. I I don't remember. I was I don't even I wasn't even alive, but. I think he had to go to the hospital. I don't know what happened, but it was like one of those really bad cases where that my Elmer's like, glue, baby. It's super glue, baby. Get out Works that Elmer's. <laughs> so you're super you're glue. also you're one you're one of seven. Yeah, one of seven. Yeah, where are you at in that lineup? What's the lineup there? I'm I'm number four, right in the middle. Okay, and you got give me the lineup like bro, oldest brother sister combo. What's the combo? Uh, oldest sister, next, uh, next oldest is brother, oldest sister, me, sister, sister, brother. Snip, snap, snip, snap, snip, snap. I got you. Ex exactly. Flip okay. flop, flip flop. Flip floppity. Okay. Uh, middle, right in the middle. All right. What was that like being like a, a middle? Well, first of all, what was it like having so many siblings and growing up? Like, what did you guys do? Like, do you have any like childhood stories or memories that just like pop out to you that are just like, like, I'll never forget when you told me that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you told me that you used to go to a place, was it like near Walmart or something and slang jerky to like the town in the town, like kind of near you? Is that wrong? Am I making that up? No, we, kind of, a little bit. So some of the details are a little fuzzy. Uh, we, the local Walmart was- Hey dude, no one, no one will be able to confirm it, dude. So you can lie as much as you want on this podcast, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We actually used to dig up uranium and go sell it by the Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> so sick. Well, it's true or yeah. no? No, we, what we would do at that local Walmart when we had, because we had, you know, five, six, seven dogs, 10 cats, something like that. Whenever the puppies would have litters, we would take the dogs out to, in, the, in a box out in front of Walmart and be like, hey, do you guys want a puppy? Free puppies. And, yeah. and we, because we don't have space for them. We don't have the food. We don't have the means to, you know, grow a, dog army for god's sake so we would go out to that walmart and if people wanted to come look at the puppies and pet them and get you know attached and all this stuff we'd say, here you can have the dog that dog jerky baby <laughs> okay, what what, what kind of no i mean like jerking them around you know having fun i didn't uh, mean like right. you know putting them in a dehydrator um yeah. <clears throat> what kind of dogs uh we had golden retrievers labs um katahula which is a australian sheep dog whoa Really What's spotty. That really really is that different than like an Australian Shepherd? Yeah, it's different. Okay. Australian Shepherds look kind of similar to a German Shepherd, but they're, I think they're darker hair color and yeah. different features about them. But a Catahoula is like a really small, fast dog that is bred for, for sheep, sheep herding and all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> what, what, what was it like then? Um, like growing up, what was just daily life like? Like up until, because at some point you moved to California, but before then, what was your life? Like when did that transition start? But before then, what was life like for you? You know, yeah. like, I'm, like, like, were you homeschooled at all? Or like, what, what was that like? Yeah, uh, everybody in my family has been homeschooled, um, especially being on a farm way out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the most important lessons are the ones you learn in life, you know, about, being responsible for animals, uh, you have, you know, you have to wake up and do the chores. You have to keep the place clean. Um, and there what was a lot of chores? other lessons. I mean, my chores was, uh, I'd have to wake up early, go feed the cows, go feed the goats, make sure that everybody was fed. And then by, by that time I was finished with that, 
milking them cows, baby. You know, I got Where that you, experience. You, you can milk a cow and a goat? Oh, yeah. Whoa, what's the technique? Squeeze and, and pull. Squeeze and pull, like a, a continuous motion. Oh, uh, okay. I've, you know, I don't like, I, you, have, you have plenty of experience with it. You'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. Um, I, could just, I could just imagine that's like a, such an interesting experience. So, I mean, it would explain why you're, um, I think you, you empathize really well with people. I can imagine like learning to love and take care for things at such a young age. Like it would make sense then that why you're so like family oriented and caring for people. Um, and uh, that, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I'm curious uh, when it comes to milking cows and milking goats, do you go straight into the carton or do you go like into a bucket and then you pour it in a carton and then you have to put it in the fridge? Like also, don't you have to like process it or something so it doesn't taste like sour? Like what does fresh milk taste like? Like straight out of the udder? Yeah, um, well, it's warm, one thing. Very mm -hmm. warm, body temperature, a little odd. Yeah. Little, it's kind of hard to, to get past it, but we would do it into a bucket and then strain it because there's different types of the, the thick cream and then the actual milk. Like that, that all comes out with the cow or out of the udder. <clears throat> and so there's a process of putting it in the bucket, straining it, straining it again. And then you have the milk and then you have like the, the cheese cream product that you would use to make butters and all this other stuff. Mm, okay. So there, there's a process to it. But every, my sisters were way more comfortable with the, the going straight from the teat right into someone's mouth than I was like, really? Oh, it had pressure. Yeah. You could squirt it like five, six feet into someone's no mouth. No way. Yeah. Dude, I could imagine like, uh, I don't know. I could just imagine you probably do like so much experimenting and messing around when you grow up on a farm and you don't have, like when you say you were homeschooled, like what, what does that mean? Like, what does that look like? Uh, well, back in the very early stages of my childhood, there wasn't, there was some like a random kindergarten textbook you could buy at like a Walmart or a Sam's club or something like that. Like the bigger um, shopping places <clears throat> that would like teach you some math and like the the rudimentary bullshit of learning to be a human and all this kind of yeah, stuff that would have like that stuff you. yeah how to read english uh, blah blah whatever all that stuff um so that was the primarily the, the like the the only thing that was considered homeschooling um but then everything else was learned outside of that like the, one of the one of the really big lessons that i think you'll appreciate a lot and i, I don't know if we've had a conversation about it but <clears throat> one of the things that my dad used to do when there was a, uh, a time for a lesson to be learned about honoring your word was bring out that wooden spoon and spank that bear buddy of yours, bro. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> there was definitely a lot of that involved, but one of the other ways that was adventured to after a many spankings or whatever you want to say was my dad created this, this, really thick industrial chain and it was about i don't know maybe a foot in diameter and you'd have to wear it around your neck and say that my words carry weight for my dad would say this to us and say hey my words carry weight i told you to feed the chickens and the goats and whatever and you waited an hour and you slept in more and you didn't do it so now they're hungry because they can't feed themselves and now you have to go do it with this chain on and you have to wear this for the rest of the day i do i do actually remember you telling me this story but yeah. uh, how how heavy do you think the chain was? If you could 50 remember. Pounds. No. Yeah, I mean, I'm not talking like a like a chain. I'm talking thick chain. Dude, I mean, I was gonna save this for later, but it definitely explains your like insane farm boy strength, bro. Like, I <laughs> I think so much of our childhood has uh oh really opens the door of possibility athletically when we become adults. And you were one of those people to me that like in the weight room, you don't seem like someone to me who's like, and I'm not, I'm not bagging on you here. I just mean like, you're not like, oh yeah, let's follow. I can't wait for the, like for me, I'm like obsessed with it because I was not naturally strong in that way. I'm not a natural jumper. I'm not like, so that stuff to me is like, oh, I gotta be doing this. I gotta be doing this thing. And I'm super into movement. And like, it changed my life. You're someone mm -hmm. who's just like, go ahead, slap a hundred kilos on there and just freaking snatch it up over your head dude like you always been someone who's just like dude this guy's got that farm boy strength bro but that makes sense i mean you're carrying a 50 pound chain you know my parents were spanking my bare butt so it's like they weren't helping me get stronger at all bro i was crying too i was bleeding for me i'm just kidding 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. But but that's yeah, that's crazy. That's really cool of your dad. Do you feel like your dad um taught you a lot about like taught you a lot early just about responsibility and caring for other things? A hundred percent. And he had to. Um because there was no other way to continue this farm to be operational. This farm, everything had to be fed and kept in motion. We had to keep this going. We had to keep this going. Otherwise, it's all going to go to shit. There was things that had to be kept in motion for this all to work out together. And you guys and, were fully self-sustainable? Yeah. You know, we okay. go to the grocery store for plastic bags and the stuff we can't produce. But other than that, we had, we had crops. We had the vegetables. We would make our own butters and noodles and everything and wheats wow. and everything. We and we harvested the animals, the the the, um, the chickens, cows, goat milk, the emu for meat, chickens for meat. You know, we had everything that we could ever need, and we had at one point in time we had a surplus of that, and that would turn into a production where we would have five hundred chickens, and we would have to you know harvest them per se. And we would sell them to people if they wanted to come by and our neighbors that are 20 minutes away would come over and buy seven chickens, eight chickens, something like that and freeze them and whatever. And so my job as a young lad with, with tiny little grippers was reach into like after the chicken had been uh, killed, plucked and everything was the, the head was cut off and everything. My job was to reach the head of the chicken and pull the organs out and put the organs back in that people would want to buy heart, liver, that stuff would go back in the whole chicken. And then I would hand off these chickens to the people that who came by and bought to buy them. Wow, dude. Meanwhile, I was eating freaking cinnamon toast crunch, dude. <laughs> you know, just trying to get along with the neighbors. That's yeah, crazy. Your little, yeah. Yeah. That's so, so crazy, dude. It's it, it. And one of the things that led that I think is, is was really huge in my developmental childhood was, um, having so much land and space, once the chores were done, there was nothing really to be done. I mean, maybe there was some homework. You had to go do this reading. You had to go do the, these math equation sheets for 20 minutes and figure out how to, what, what is five times four and all this other hand job stuff that was like the, the societal norm for education. And then after that, I would go off and hike for hours, go mm -hmm. find turtles, bo little box turtles and bring them back up and race them across my basketball court. I'd go chop down a tree way out in the, boonies that my dad would never find because it was maybe a waste of a tree and it was still growing and it was like well why are you going to cut down this tree for no reason but it's like that was part of my imagination and adventurous side that I could just go do whatever I wanted hmm. and I had the best friends in the family to do that we didn't really have anybody uh else near us or around us that was like family were our only friends hmm. yeah so you did you have like <laughs> that is a strange question but like when did you get introduced to society then yeah. I mean, that's a very applicable question. Um, also, my hey, just, just really quick, TJ, uh, I don't know if you're like kicking the table or something, but sometimes it moves the camera. Just letting you know, could be your feet. Okay. Maybe I'm, I'm touching the, the desk. Okay. Anyways. Yeah. Anyways. Um, <clears throat> so you know, now that we can, we kind of got past that part, we can move into where I, I ended up moving to California. Uh, it was, an, I was about 10 years old. When my dad, and this was kind of the time when the Wi-Fi and the, the three G's and everything was starting to kind of really hit the ground running. And that, that process was the, the fine details of that process is called fiber optics. Fiber optics mm -hmm. is those really tiny cables that allow you to have internet and allow you yeah, to have yeah. different types, you know, all that stuff. Um, my dad and his three buddies went, moved out to California and started a business that specialized in fiber optics. And especially in a place like California, where the top of the food chain with revolutionizing things that was huge the business was huge and so they wanted a piece of it they need so that first class wi-fi baby that's what i'm saying they needed that internet speed dude, yeah. dude living with dial-up was no joke yeah you know yeah so they ended up moving to california for i don't know five six months before the rest of the family moved out with them and then that's when we lived in and you could probably relate to this we lived in the cold sack 37 feet from the next neighbor and you know all these kids are doing the schools and having the recesses and all that stuff and i'm still the adventurous young soul so i would take a bike and just ride around the neighborhood go in the in the canals that are gated off i'd sneak in and figure out how to do it and whatever and i got caught and whatever it's just like i'm just having fun i'm done this is my little area you know to explore and it was a total shock because then i, I slowly started to realize that i was supposed to be confined to this what 
this, you know, a fourth of an acre lot where the house and the backyard, and that was the only thing that existed in my realm now. Mm. And it was a huge shock because all, I mean, I had, I don't even know if the, many of the viewers know how big an acre is, but I had almost 300 of them. Daddy doesn't even know how big an acre is. It's, yeah, it's ginormous. Mm. With endless, you know, I, I never re, uh, explored all of the sections of the land that we owned. So, uh, were you a troublemaker as a kid? How would you define yourself? A hundred percent. I would define myself as a shithead with a mindset to bulldoze anybody that I didn't uh, appreciate or respect. Hmm. That was just how I grew up as a kid. And like, I was confident enough in my abilities to know what I wanted and I was going to do whatever to get them. And if I didn't get them, I would throw a fit. Can you, do you have like a childhood memory that comes to mind that would really describe that? <clears throat> like, cause I could just, like in my head, I imagine like, uh, I don't know, someone who's like, this is a terrible example and I'm already going down the wrong path, but this is, I got to just say what's on my mind here. It's like, it's like, I could imagine uh, like a white person going to like a part in an, in an indigenous tribe in Africa where they've never seen a white person before. And they're like, Whoa, what is this? This guy's color skin is like, I've never seen something like this before. Like in some strange way, that's how I imagine you being suburbanized you know where you go and you're just like whoa these houses are so close to get whoa what are all these kids doing here there's other people like, i'm sure it's not that intense but I, i'm really curious i'm genuinely curious like what was that like for you to be civilized and be like whoa this is way different than how i just spent my entire last 10 years of my life you know yeah um i don't because of the, the age i was during that time i don't remember such a big um different per se difference per se uh, but it, I mean, obviously it was a shock because eventually it turned into a shock because I would just go out and adventure and go around and explore and go in people's houses and, you know, make these friends. And it was like, oh, this is great. I have so many friends on the same street that are all within 400 yards of me. This is awesome. Go around, you know, bike ride around the neighborhood and get caught by police and be taken home to my parents. Be like, oh, you can't let your son you can't ride a bike without a helmet. It was like, what the fuck? Yeah. I got a, I, my parents got a ticket for allowing me to ride a bike without a helmet. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, I was riding a bike without a helmet with a sledgehammer and a fucking wheelbarrow on my back at home. What the hell is this? Yeah. You know, and that and was like, the biggest shock of like the, the rules of society being in a close knit area. And then uh, like just in school in general, did you feel like uh, it was hard for you to get along with other kids or the opposite? Did it feel like, oh, this is amazing. Now I have not just my brothers and sisters. Now I have all these other potential friends and people to hang out with. Um. Yeah, it, it was a few years uh, until I actually went to school because we we remained uh, homeschooled and tried to do the whole thing at home and realized that having six kids homeschooled in the same roof without having really very much freedom to go explore and be be outside of this house was really difficult. You know, especially for the youngsters, it's like, dude, my mom was going crazy. I, I you could I couldn't even imagine trying to raise five kids that are all in the preteen learning how the world works and everything and wanting to go out and have fun and not getting what they want and throwing a fit and being upset that they can't go outside after dark and, or like as soon as it starts getting you know those street lights come on you got to be home all that kind of stuff it's like um so we, we kind of my mom did as best she could for within that process as long as she could um but then I, I ended up going to like a it wasn't a public school it was like a, char a charter school i don't know how to describe it it was uh like um like a uh, a school that supported somewhat of a different type of learning, you know, hands on a lot of uh, a lot of projects, a lot of like working together to kind of uh, grow your minds as, as a whole. And there was only about you know fifty sixty kids in this school, and it was like mm. one the one class of like twenty would move classrooms to the the next teacher, and that was English, and then the next teacher, and wow. that was history, and then the next teacher, and like so that was it was really small environment. And so that was probably the best way for me to kind of get introduced to that whole societal sure, thing. Like yeah, you're saying. Sounds like it. <clears throat> because there was, I mean, right off the top, there was a lot of differences that I had to adjust to. You know, I, I remember the one time that, uh, the, the one time that I was ever actually called a bully and went to the principal's office where it was like, I was, we were out of recess, we were having fun and we were just running, playing for, we play football, we play soccer, we play um, what's tether ball, we play wall ball, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I was, I, the competitive nature in me was I was going to kill everybody. 
And I didn't care if you're my friend. I'm going to bulldoze you because I'm, mm. I'm in, in the spirit of the game and the competition mm. of it. I want to win. And one, we were doing laps or something like that. We were just like running and trying to get all the energy out of us. And I, I would like go and like, and like a friendly gesture from what I thought was a friendly gesture. I would go pinch this part, like right here, right by the neck. You still my, do my... that shit, dude. And let me tell you, it's not a friendly gesture. Okay. <laughs> Freaking hate it, dude. That farm strength comes out wearing that damn chain all, all that time. <laughs> Freaking hurts, but continue. That's so funny, but... bro. You still do that shit. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah. So I, and, and that's still maybe something that I haven't learned. Or now I've, I've understood that maybe some people are just pussies. And it's like my way of saying, wow. hey. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Dude, no, you just got those freaking crab arms, dude. <laughs> yeah, the clenchers. Um, and so that was, I did, I did that one or two times. Just like, oh, come on, you got more than that. Like, oh, you're being so slow. Like, haha, like, you know, a little kid is like, yeah, yeah. A little bit testing the waters. Like, but then also it's like, come on, like, you, you got more than that. I know, I, yeah. I, I know you do. And, and the kid reported me to the principal and I got called in and was like, you're being a bully, all this stuff, this kid, you know, thinks you're, you're inflicting physical violence on him and all this stuff. And I'm like, what? And I just was like, started crying. I was like, dude, I, I don't think I'm, I'm a, I, I didn't think I was being a bully. I was just, I don't know. And that, and that was part of the thing that I was the learning process for <laughs> the learning curve of that. Like, dude, I didn't, under, I don't understand all this. Can I, let me ask you something and now we're kind of going to jump, jump around a little bit, but I'm curious, how do you handle, how has that changed in you now? Like learning how to handle that side of you that you know is really competitive. Because when I hear you talk like that, I empathize so much. It sounds so much like my story, bro. I, when I was younger, uh, I was super, super, super competitive. And like when it came to tetherball, when it came to the, we would run a mile, who could run a mile the fastest, like whatever we did, wall ball, kickball, like all that stuff. It's like, I was bigger than everyone for the most part. And like, but also super competitive and loved winning and worked like loved sports, loved being active. And my story with that, and I think I've talked about this maybe on other podcasts, but just it, to me, it started bringing out a side of me that as I got older, I was like, Ooh, I don't like the direction we're going. And that's why when I was 12, I like stopped competitive sports completely for a couple of years and skateboarded and thought I was going to be a pro skater. And like, cause that was just me and it was just competing with me. And like, I could still access that part of me, but it wasn't in a like violent way. And sometimes I had the same thing as a kid. It was just like, I was, I couldn't lose. I, I wouldn't lose. I didn't want to lose. And so I'm curious yeah. because clearly <clears throat> there's something with being super competitive and succeeding at a high level. There's some correlation there. But in my experience, I've had to learn uh, that I have this I, like pit bull inside of me and that it's okay to accept that part of you. It's okay to release him from his cage, but also making sure it doesn't bleed into other areas of my life. I'm just curious, how have you managed your competitive nature as you've become an adult? Like, have you seen progress in that or what's that? Do you still battle with that at all or not really? Are you pretty good at uh, compartmentalizing like He's out when we play, and then when we're done, he gets put away. Like, what's that like for you? You really yeah. feel that? Yeah, 100 percent You know, and I think any kid that has a competitive nature that says they don't relate to that is just lying to themselves. That the, the, there's so much of that that is engraved in the human nature of survival. You know, trying to who's going to catch the bigger boar way back in the old days? Who's going to who's going to feed for their provide for their village and their family better than that? That, that is a innate human nature hundred um, percent. And so the, the learning curve for me was very, very steep. You know, when I was a, a young uh, teenager and, and doing like the youth teams in the club and, the, and, and all that stuff, it was terrible. I was like, this is partly why we're like the, where all the, the, the rumors and stuff kind of gets and the stories you've heard and you, you thought you knew and all this kind of stuff about me was like, dude, I was a shithead, absolute shithead on the court complete disregard and disrespect for my teammates because I was upset that I wasn't winning completely selfish reactions to different parts of the game because either I wasn't performing or the other, my team wasn't performing or the other team was just maybe just better than us. It was just, and like would throw fits and whatever. And like, that's, that, that was the rude awakening for me. And especially my dad was like watching this. He understood where it come from. It came from, but then was also like, dude, you, you got to change something because it's not going to be healthy. In terms of a team sport, you know, it's not, it's not sustainable. Um, and this is why I'm so interested in 
better understanding how you feel that's changed or if you still struggle with it because as someone who's been your teammate uh that still exists in my boy i know that but yeah. i've also i also feel like in the last couple of years specifically you've come a long way and this is what i love about you so much is like you recognize you know you're not you know what people perceive i know who you really are and as a friend it's like i see you still you still battling with being a good teammate, also being super competitive, but learning how to, how to balance all of it. And so I'm curious, like, uh, am I making that, like, are you, do you feel like it's something that you still struggle with or like how, how what are you working through now? Are you still, is it, do, do you get what I'm trying to say? I feel like I'm, I'm yeah, not yeah. trying to speak. I don't want to speak for you. I don't want to just put things on you, but I'm, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. 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 I, it's very clear, obviously, though you just said that I'm still dealing with that or dealing with it is not the right way to describe it, but um, experiencing a lot of that. And now with coming with the age and the maturity and the understanding of how that applies to other people and their perception and what they see is not even close to what I see. Mm. And that was the one of the biggest learning lessons for me was the body language and like the being a good teammate, you know, and, and like you said, over the past few years, it's been going since going pro, it's been a blaring thing that's like, okay, either you're going to fix this or it's not going to be very good for, you know, you're the people you want to play with and the, the relationships you're going to build with these people and all that stuff. And uh, a big part of it for me is in the maturity side was understanding that that's there and accepting that it's going to, that's there. Okay. But then understanding how to shift it a little bit do the, the do, do have some of the better body language at times and and or have the conversations with the team is like listen 85 percent of the time when i'm mad and i see i have bad negative body language and all this stuff it's like <laughs> dude i'm upset with myself i'm upset with something that i'm doing wrong i'm not performing because a big thing that i really still live by is i can't some most of the time don't have the um the desire and or place to call someone else out on their shit if i am not doing my job if I'm yes. having a lousy performance, then how can I tell Johnny McBuckets over here to dig a ball Johnny or McBuckets. to, you know, or to, what, I was just a random name, but like, what, how is that? How do I feel comfortable in myself and my own being of carrying that 50 pound chain to be like, dude, why are you not digging a ball? Why are you not in the right positions? You're out of position. You're not passing this ball. Well, you're playing like shit. If I'm doing the same thing. You know, I think that's interesting. I, I, but what I think is, uh, in fact, I just was describing this to Robert Andringa, our friend from last year as well, uh, from the Netherlands. <laughs> I was talking about it too, where it's like, what I could imagine is more difficult for you is you practicing at 50% is still better than everyone in the gym. And this is what I'm talking about. I mean, specifically like in the professional gym, it's like TJ kind of like not trying you're still getting aces. You're still scoring in creative ways. Maybe you're not blasting every ball, but you're just like still scoring. You're still roofing guys. Like I can imagine it's even more difficult. And I experienced this uh, just to be set, the, set the, uh, the mood here. TJ and I are both humble guys, I think. But let's be honest about stuff, you know? And like for me, when yeah. I was in con, when I was in con and I was having an amazing season, I felt the same where it's like practice isn't challenging me anymore, dude. And I can get away with practicing at like, 60% and like tipping way more balls in the middle and still scoring at like a, a rate that's like very high and like still performing at a high level. But in my head, it's like, I'm not trying to get better, dude. I'm just like, I'm upset that uh, we just passed an easy free ball over like that kind of stuff pissed me off so much like little mistakes where it's like, no, that doesn't happen at this level. But I can imagine it makes it even more difficult for you. Because you practicing at 50%. No one would really know unless they really knew you. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, does it, is it yeah. hard? Is it almost hard that like you can get away with more bullshit than the average player? Um, uh, I think it, it, it replaces itself as a good scapegoat every once in a while, being able to get away with a lot of stuff, maybe more than everybody else would be able to get away with is, is definitely a good scapegoat every once in a while. And it, that is a definitely a negative part. Um, because like you said, if, if I'm doing this at 55, 60%, 50%, whatever it is, and I'm still performing, outperforming my team, then it starts to build a negative narrative in my mind of, oh, see, this is all I have to do. And you guys still can't, you know, and then it, then it just swirls into this negative emotion, negative, um, you know, 
swirl of of, uh, of thoughts in the mind and, the, and then it just becomes negative poison for me. So that's why I've kind of started to, or I, I mean, I've had the, the innate desire from a very young age to continue to be the best possible per, uh, player that I possibly can and strive for protection, uh, protection, <laughs> strive for perfection at all levels. Uh, and, and which is interesting about playing the game of volleyball is there's never been a case in volleyball in the history of the game that there's ever been a perfect game played. Never. No one has ever won 25-0, zero errors, everything went well, and it, never in the history of volleyball has that ever occurred. But yet I still just strive for that for myself every single day. Mm. Um, <clears throat> obviously, a lot of the time, it doesn't work out like that. And so the, that is one of the things that I've used in those moments where it's like, dude, I can get away with 50%. It's, you feel the low. You feel the... the it's like the, uh, like a like a metaphysical weight, and you're just like, mm. it's this. It's like isn't challenging me. I don't want to get better, and it's one of those those scenarios, those gray clouds that sits over a professional athlete. It's like, okay, how do I get myself reengaged in this practice, this training, this sport that I'm playing? How do I get myself reengaged with that? And so that's been one of the mechanisms that I use a lot. Is okay, I'm not performing in these areas. This, 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 this. this. I'm going to work on passing, and I'm going to work on this, and I want to be better be the best in the whole world at these things and that's that's what i continually strive for of like dude i definitely am one, one of the worst passers on my team um i can uh, the attacking comes natural i can do this but i'm read blocking not good and i'm serving like shit what are the things that i need to do how, how do i go about doing them and that kind of like every once in a while when, the, when you get into that low that is like a really good spark that's like okay i don't care what the, everybody else is doing i'm going to work on working on a high flat line or I'm going to work on foot serve reception, or I'm going to work on making sure my last two steps are good with my serve approach. Like th that's when it comes into those fine details of really understanding what it takes to reignite that own fire that you're kind of going through. Uh, I kind of want to, this is really great. And there's a lot more I want to add to this, but I kind of want to jump back to uh, you just find volleyball. Like when did you, when did you start playing and when did you realize like, Oh, I'm pretty damn good at this. Because I think that has a lot to do with who you are now. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I started when I was 13. Or no. I started indoor volleyball at 13. I started um, beach volleyball with uh, my good, our good friend Josh Tuaniga at 11 years old when I just had just moved to California and, and trying to find some families to do some sport things with or whatever. And we were partners um, for – two, three years, we won every beach tournament that we ever played in and all this kind of stuff. It was like a, it was like a match made in heaven, if you will. <laughs> mm. uh, started playing that. And then I, they, Josh's family started talking about, oh, we're going to go do this, do this club indoor thing because they have, they have a big issue with indoor volleyball. So we're going to take our son to this tryout and all this stuff. We're going to do, we're going to see what this is like. And my dad was like, do you want to go do it? I was like, yeah, this is, I like volleyball. This is fun. You know, and, and at that time I was like, I was probably a foot taller than everybody in my age. And I, you know, I was just, the height really plays a difference in when you're young because you don't have the physical attributes. You can't jump out of a gym. If you're just taller, you jump a little, you know, you're a higher reach and that's about it. You're telling me you weren't a natural jumper, bro. Be honest with me. Look at me in the eyes right now. You, you understand what I'm trying to say though. I, I you don't totally have the physicality you're when you're young. I, I, I was always in. Side note, sidebar off the record. Were you a natural jumper or not? Be honest with me right now. Yeah. All natural. I mean, Far, you were maybe, I was, was going to say, bro, you've been weight training since you were freaking five years old, you know, <laughs> like I could, I could only imagine, you know, and you came out of the womb weightless. So <laughs> that's how you look in the air. It all makes sense, dude. All right. Continue. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I'll remember the, my first 13s or yeah, it was a 13s team tryout. I'll, I'll remember for the rest of my life. I, I went into this gym to the indoor volleyball, never been a part of anything like uh, like a big team oriented, um, anything like that. And the coach, the club director walked me over and was like, oh, so this is your coach, this is your team. They're like already done with warming up and like going through drills. And my coach, the director like walks me over. It's like, oh yeah, this is your coach. So I was like, oh coach, nice to meet you, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm thinking about giving it a try. And he's like, okay. So he walks me over to the other side of the court where they're, they're doing like a, a passing drill or something like, I don't remember what the drill was. But he's like, oh, do you want me to explain it to you? I was like, no, I'll just sit here and watch and I'll figure it out. Like, I don't need your explanation. I'll just sit here and analyze what's going on and I'll, I'll figure it out. 
and that that I think that is one of the biggest things with like it describes how I've kind of gone my my career about volleyball is dude I soak up everything about this game. You know, I have the I have the the RAM, if you will, up up top to understand the different parts of the game and and so then the, I pick up a lot of the the game IQ from just watching and learning. I I think that's really interesting. I also think like this innate desire to want to learn things on your own at your own pace in your own way um, feels like a lost art. And I only say that because first of all, I think there's finally becoming a lot of amazing resources for kids to learn and grow um, middleblockeracademy.com. Check it out. That's one of them. I'll tell you that right now you can work with your boy. Um, Southwest plug. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, what I, what I'm trying to say is, and then on the other hand, don't like go figure it out on your own. I think that's like such a beautiful thing. Honestly, like I, it's something I struggle with too. It's like, I also from an early age was very independent, wanted to do things my way. And I almost get caught now where I'm like, Oh, what's the best way to do this? Or what's the best uh, restaurant to go eat instead of just like, I want Mexican food. Oh, there's a Mexican food place here. Sick. I'm gonna go check it out. You know, like yeah. you're just doing it on, you don't need the review. You don't need someone to tell you, Oh, this is TJ. If you just put your hands together, like you're, you're just like, I think it actually must have boosted your learning curve so much wanting to innately figure things out on your own. And I only brought, I only brought all this up because I think so many kids are constantly looking for someone to tell them what to do. How many reps do mm -hmm. I do? How many of this do I know? What's the exercise that's going to change? My What's the, it's like, just go do something and be curious about what you're doing. Like curiosity rules all, I believe that, you know, mm -hmm. and it sounds like you had that nature since you were a kid. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. It, the, the, the curiosity and the drive to really figure something out for everything that it was worth and workings and every little piece of it really was the driver to be like, okay, I, I like the sport. I have fun. I'm good at it. Let's continue to figure this out and strive to be as good as I possibly can at it because I'm not going to just come into this thing and be like, oh, I'm kind of good at it. Let's go try skateboarding. And so, so now walk with me here. You're 13. You're like, nah, coach, I got it. I, I'm, I got this one. And uh, like from the beginning, was it like, oh, this kid's going to be something special? Like, be honest with me. What, what was your experience like as you began to, you started off sucking, obviously. Like, what was your learning curve like? Like, when did it become like, oh, this is something not only do I love, but I'm going to excel at? Yeah, uh, it, it was quite a few years after that because my first experience with it was that team – really bad. I was really bad, you know, uh, going to trying to figure out how, how all this works, going to the ASC way back in the day and like seeing all these teams, the top two, three teams are just like un ungodly volleyball athletes in my eyes, you know, I'm 13 years old and seeing all this happen. And it's like, dude, I want to, I'm better than, I want to be better than him. And I want to, I want to be like that. I want to be able to do that stuff. And it, it took a while for me. I continued to be in the 13s and then the 14s and all this stuff. And that's when it kind of started to click. Like, dude, I have a talent for this, this sport, you know, and I want to, I want to be able to expose everything that I have and expl exploit, I guess is about the word, the word I was looking for, exploit everything that I have and show myself and what else, everything that I could possibly do in this sport. And so it was a, in the beginning was a, a sharp learning curve because I was terrible. You know, that first year kind of was subbed in and out, played opposite, didn't even play outside, didn't have the ball control to play outside. And, and, that, and that's where the kind of the story started, was just me sucking at volleyball and like still loving the game, but just absolutely sucking at volleyball and then figuring it out that I wanted to strive to be better. So did it, uh, like how often were you playing then? Like you're 13, 14, was it just like, because I know sometimes the the schedule for kids is like, they have school and then it's, you know, uh, Saturday, Sunday, they have training, or if it's not training, it's a tournament. Like, were you a, a weekend only kid or were you like playing volleyball literally all the time? Like, what was it like for you? Uh, I guess one of the big parts that we kind of skipped over was the fact that my, my, my mo mother and my older brother was a coach of my younger or older sister. So like brother, sister, mom was the coach of my older sister in like a club, whatever. So I was, three years younger so I was like 10 just barely turning 10 like 11 that kind of age and I wasn't old enough to stay at home 
And so I, I, got, I was dragged to those practices. So what I would do is I would sit there in those practices and I would just hit a ball against the hour, the wall for mm. two hours. <laughs> I was one of those kids. I'd just sit there and just try to figure out if I could get six or seven in a row. And then all of a sudden I had to go shag the ball and then come back and then do it again and see if I could get 10. And mm. like, that was my life and before I ever started playing volleyball. So I already kind of got a little taste of it, watching mm. it, women's volleyball, girls volleyball at that age is just like, you know, I don't want to say anything negative, but it was just like a different type of game. Hmm. Um, and then I saw I, that that's what it kind of started for me was I wanted to see what it was. I wanted to experience it and I wanted to see what I could do with it. And that's how I kind of got, that was like the very beginning, like little taster of, of volleyball. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was, that, but that led I planted into me, thy seed. planted thy seed. Exactly. That led me to go, to go to their practices during the week. I had maybe one or two practices a week down in San Diego. Um, and then I would go to on the weekends and play beach and then pepper at home with my sisters and brothers all the time. We, we would, we would string a, like a piece of a rope from co- the end of my van to uh, lock, locked onto the house and create a, one little tiny string volleyball net. We would play volleyball in my front yard every day for hours, mm. you know, my, and, and it helped having the family that was already exposed to the sport to be able for me to be able to kind of introduce myself to it. Cause we did volleyball all the time. Mm. Dude, that's pretty sweet. I mean, so how, how many of you were playing volleyball? Like, do you remember sessions where it was like you and your mom and your dad or your brothers and sisters like playing? Yeah, on, I, I picture like a closing or a clothing line, you know? Exactly. I like, exactly I like to picture you line. washing clothes like old fashioned way on like one of those boards with the soap, you know, when you were young. <laughs> yeah. you, we, did, we took rotations. It was like king of the court uh, washing clothes rotation. Dude, that's pretty good. <laughs> That's a pretty nice yeah, punishment, that, actually. Wow. Yeah, that's how. Wow, it was. for those of you listening, that's actually a, a great thing to play for. Like you, you bet in like losing team or losing if you're playing doubles. Like loser has to wash the other person's clothes at the practice right there with like the old uh, washboards, dude. That is pretty disrespectful, and I kind of love it <laughs> hearing it right now for the first time. All right, anyway, you won't sorry. get it started. You won't. Tell me, I want one more time, dude. <laughs> all right continue sorry yeah no, that, that's how it was you know i would get the family out there we would we would be, all be playing one-on-one king of the court style r- r- win the rally go through have someone serve you and it was like uh an eight by eight court with a rope through the middle of it so cool and it would you know full to full you know and i remember being a little kid and and not being able to beat my sister and that aggravated me to no end because mm-hmm. my sister was three years older and she had the, maybe a little bit more ball control was a little bit more physical, physical in terms of development, <clears throat> and would just would beat me, and and I would ask her to play. I we I'm no, not even kidding. We would go to the homeschool thing from like eight to maybe twelve thirty or one, come back at one, and I would play with her until seven p.m. Dark. I would make her play with me because it was like, dude, I can't stand losing to you right now. You're gonna we're gonna play another game. We're gonna play another game. We're gonna play another game, and that went on for years. Did you guys play one on one? Yeah, it was one on one. Like two so touch, short three touch, style. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three touch. Yeah, yeah, that's so, so nice. Figure out how to get the ball back, bounce it off the car windshield, come back and try to tip it into the block or, you know, play it off or whatever, or spike it as hard as I could. It's like, it, it, I could not win. That's so and that sick. was that, that drive as a young kid that I was like, dude, Talia, I'm sorry. That was my, that's my sister's name, Talia. I'm sorry, but we have to play another game. We're, 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 and mom would be like, hey, dinner's ready. And I'm like, all right, well, after this game, we play three more games. And then finally, going to eat dinner it was already cold that's so sick yeah uh, side note really quick if you can hear someone vacuuming do you hear it, someone vacuuming because i hear it no. okay cool never mind the cleaning lady's here and i uh i don't know i don't know i'm doing the podcast it's totally cool though dude do whatever you want you know um <laughs> i love that kind of rebellion anyways uh so the part i think uh first of all I, I love i love hearing that because i also like i didn't have i played with my dad a little bit but um playing against my roof like i love hearing those like origin stories of just like you just love volleyball and you'll do anything to play you know yeah. and volleyball is you know like you said when you're young your options are hit against the wall really you know like figure it <laughs> out set against the wall pass against the wall you know make up your own games like hit seven in a row i love that um and now let's like move forward a little bit towards when did you have the moment of like, uh, 
okay, I'm pretty good at this now. Like, for example, like when was your, like, dude, I'll never forget the day that uh, I, and my dad unfortunately listens to these and I'm sorry, dad, I'm, I'm about to do this to you, but I'll never forget the day that uh, I finally <laughs> like got taller than my dad. Then it was like, it was official that I was bigger than my dad. I was like maybe 17 or something. And I remember, I remember like doing something, we were like bowling something and I picked him up and I threw him over my shoulder and then I like sat him down. We both kind of paused and it was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> this is the day that you're bigger than your dad, you know? Like, did you have a, did you have a day that was like, oh, guess I'm the shit at this, you know? Yeah. Um, throughout high school and actually in the early parts of high school was like when the, uh, like the clubs and all that stuff was kind of working in and out of the high school volleyball and all that stuff. Um, I say that day, that day that you're talking about for me was um, my sophomore year of high school. I got a call from John Spira to come into the gym and be a practice player and start getting the exposure within the senior national team and start figuring out what it is my, in my future to be in that gym. Wait, a sophomore in high school? Yeah. So you were good enough for the national team coach to be like, hey, come be involved with our senior team. Yeah. Okay. Walk me back like a, a one moment to where I'm looking for like your personal moment of just like, oh, TJ's not like the other kids in my school, you know? Did, was it like freshman year of high school, you started playing organized high school or like my 14 year in club, it was like, oh, TJ is going to be someone special. Like, for example, I'll never forget because Taylor Sander is my age and I play, grew up playing against him as a kid. And I'll never forget 15's year, my first year playing, watching him play. It was like, he stood out like, oh, this guy's the future of volleyball. And I know you have a similar uh, story, you know, where it was like, oh, who's this TJ kid? He's a baller. Yeah. Um, eh. It, I mean, I won 14, 15, 16, and 17 club. Um, so I guess it, it could have started a little bit in the, the 14s, 15s range where it was like, oh, he's, you know, hitting the ball harder than anyone. You know, and the, my favorite thing of the, all the club experiences was the, the pregame warm-up. Come on, boys. What we live for when we got that T, that testosterone is flying high, dude. Hormones are flying high, and all you want to do is bounce the ball. I get it. Dude, soaring, right? My favorite thing was to watch the other team's face as we're doing our warm up, and I would just bounce two balls the entire time. Just you know, I was, no, oh man, I would do no warm up and just go out there and hit a two ball up to the ceiling light and break a light. Like it was just like, all right, this is what this is what we're playing against right now. The other kids' hey. faces were just like, Mah. for all those kids right now who are like literally cheering. They're co all the coaches right now are so sad for you to be saying that, and all kids listening to this are just absolutely cheering. What's the secret to bouncing the ball? Like, what's the what's the setup you need? If you, if some kid came to you and was like, TJ, how can I learn to bounce the ball like you do in warm ups? Because there's like a million videos of you bouncing balls in gyms and hitting the ceiling and shit. Like, what would you? What advice would you give to that kid? What's the setup, baby? Yeah, um, yeah. There's, uh, I don't know. Tight I ball. Think tight ball. Obviously, you want the ball tight. Do you like more yeah, of like yeah, a, I mean, what's the height? What's the set height you like? Like, walk me through. What's the perfect opportunity for you to bounce the ball straight to the floor? Fist, we talking. What's the approach like? One and a half, kind of. What's the walk me through it? Oh yeah, it's it's very similar to a first tempo, like a like like a one one ball, maybe like a one and a half, give yourself a little bit of the time. But you, I mean, you're you're going as hard as you can to your approach. Like the first step, I guess, is having a good setter that knows how to set you a, a, a 60, 40 ball on the other side of the net. You can go up. 60 40 right is your tempo, ratio? I would say 60 40, maybe 70 30, depending on how good 70 you on 70% on the other side, 30% still on your side. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's, that's the, the perfect ratio for bouncing a ball. Um, <laughs> uh, that, and because, it, because of the tempo of the set, you have to start and just book your approach. There is no waiting around, wait, waiting to see where the ball is. You have to go and commit. And if the set's not there, then it's not going to be, it's not going to work out. But if it's there, all that momentum is going into bouncing the ball. And so do you like to like toss the ball? Do you, do you pass it kind of fast? Like, cause what I'm hearing right now is like, you don't want like a high loopy set and you don't pass the ball like high either. It's like, everything's a little bit less high. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Cause the, the, there's a little bit more time for error and, and thinking right. and all this kind of stuff, but it's more of just like a reactionary thing. And so I'll pass the ball almost right to his hands and he just goes, go. Like kind of just like lobs it up, and then that's when it's game time, baby. Let that testosterone soar. We uh, fist or open hand? What's your? Uh, we're fisting, baby. 
Fisty? Oh, yeah. Straight down. All right, all right. I wasn't sure if, if it was more open hand or fist, but it's you, you're a, a believer in the fist. Yeah, fist oh, yeah. There's, there's, there's times and places for the fist. I'll tell, that's all I'm going to say. I'll tell you what, dude, the kids are going to love that. I'm very excited. We just went through that formula, dude. And I, I you know, for as much as uh, coaches say hit line and as much as you now as a professional know that not hit line, uh, hit high off the hands. Like it's such a skill you need. It's such a skill you need to have. The kids have some fun. Let them boost their egos, you know, like let them bounce the ball, baby. You know, absolutely. Get that confidence going nice and like, you know, get those shoulders out, bounce the ball, and let it fly, baby. Yeah. Um, okay. So obviously in club, you're very well known for you and Josh just tearing up the club scene. Now walk me to like, you get to college and it's like another day at the office. What was your, what was your college experience like at Long Beach? Yeah. Um, I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Alan Knipe really, um, is the best coach that I've ever had in terms of one instilling a system for off the court, on the court classroom, everything, um, holding the, holding to his guns about said system and holding us all accountable to this. And, and then that made us strive to be better in every life and mostly volleyball stuff, you know, the, and that was the, the turning point in my life where I really just hit this upward, just like, because it was instilled the, the work ethic. I already had the work ethic and the determination to be the best that I could be. It wasn't like a work ethic for anybody else. But then it turned into a work ethic for the team. Everybody was on the same page with grinding and being able, being okay. Or the fear of having no fear of conflict was one of the, the phrases that we used of, listen, I, I, I'm doing my job and I'm, I'm not going to fear the conflict of me telling you, like, hey, I know you can do better than that. Pass the ball better. Or you're in the wrong spot. Get in the right position to dig this ball. And which was, I mean, if you can tell from what I just said, right up my alley with that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. It was like, great. Mm -hmm. But then it was also instilling like, dude, you fear of conflict is like that guy can is very much allowed in our gym to pipe right back to you and be like, dude, what are you talking about? You're not doing your job. How are you going to call me out on my shit? And that was um, where the really the huge learning phase all four years of college. It was like, dude, this is the healthiest environment to play volleyball. You know, we, we preach these things every single day. We, we stick to our guns on them. And if anybody sways or whatever, then there's a conversation we have like, dude, if you don't think that you know, the work ethic for the team and, and, and wearing this logo on your chest isn't the most important thing in your life, then all right, let's have a conversation. This might not be the place for you. That's fine. There's no hard feelings, whatever, but it's just maybe might not be the place for you. If you're not going to come in and work hard every day, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, it's not, it's not the place for you. And that's okay. So that's kind of where that all started for me and really, really solidified that idea of, dude, this is, this is um, a, a career. Uh, can you talk to me about, uh, TJ on the court versus TJ off the court? Because Interesting. here's what I want to say. And only tell me what you feel like is worth telling me. Uh, here's what I'll tell you is in college. Um, it took me a long time to really understand what my priorities were. It hmm. took me a long time to realize I was the party kid. You know, I was a kid who felt like my, what I did off the court didn't really affect what I was doing on the court. Cause I still like you, I was very driven. I was uh, very self-motivated. I always tried really hard, um, but I was really competitive and had a really like addicted, addictive personality, you know, to something that was so healthy. And I also had a very addictive personality to things that uh, weren't serving me in healthy ways, even though at the time it was like, what are you talking about? I'm 19 and resilient and I can do whatever I want. And mm -hmm. I don't need anyone to tell me what to do. And I don't want to say that we're the same there, but I will say this. When you came last year, it was like, I knew that you and I would connect in a special way because I think we have similar stories. I think we both um, were attracted to a lifestyle that maybe didn't serve us in the most positive way. Yeah. And maybe I'm wrong, but I, I do think uh, having this conversation with you, I think is really important for people, for especially for kids in college and for younger people. So I just want to know yeah. from you, like, what was it like balancing um, who you were on the court and who you were off the court? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say 
uh, for me, one of the big things that I, I really experienced and was used as a crutch in college was that it was two separate worlds for me. Kind of like what you said, the other things don't really affect the way I, the way I perform on the court because it's two separate lifestyles, we'll say. Hmm. When I'm in the volleyball gym, I'm checked into this whole realm and this is where I'm at. And then when I'm outside of college, I mean, you, you know what the kind of struggles you go through, not the struggles, whatever, the experiences you have with going, doing the partying thing, being out, want to be cool with your friends, the peer pressure, the, the peer pressure you end up doing there, there's a whole different lifestyle. And that, like what you said is like a, maybe a negative outcome. I think that is potentially spun in a positive developmental state of go out, dude, have your fun. Like what you kind of like what you preach, dude, go try it, do have your fun, whatever. But unless you have the, the understanding that there's a means to an end, if you fall down that path, that's what you're going to turn into. And it's great. You, you decide that, whatever, it's all good. <clears throat> but then the other side of that is understanding that you can have the experiences. You can do this kind of stuff. If you want to go out and I, I was, like you said, I was a part of your two. I took, I definitely took the time to go out and experience these things. You know, but then at the end of the day, what was the, the prior, my priority, my main priority, you know, on the court, my priority was volleyball off the court. My priority is maybe go and get fucked up, you know, here, you know, and there's a balance. And well, here's my, the reason I bring this up, um, not to put you on the spot and please feel free to tell me to fuck off. And I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but I, I bring it up because I know there's people who, who really struggle in understanding what what even does that mean to balance it all and when i look at when i was 19 it's like i thought i had it pretty balanced you know yeah uh, I, I really thought and the difference and this is where i i think you and i have a special connection is like i also wasn't one for advice it was very rare that someone was going to tell me something like if michael jordan would have came down and been like taylor you're smoking weed every day what are you doing buddy like stop doing that and one day you're going to be one of the best in the world i would have been like got it gotcha you're the goat i mean gotcha you know, it wouldn't, yeah. it wouldn't, it wouldn't have phased me at all, dude. Cause that's just how I was at that age. And I look back and, and, you know, I have, I've had parents who reach out to me and they I've actually had parents reach out to me to want to speak to their kids. And what's so tough for me is it's like, I'm still trying to figure out the best way to word it. Because a lot of times I think about how could I have gotten through to me? Because now that I'm, you know, 30, mm -hmm. almost 31, it's like, uh, I think being such a party kid it's like I needed to go through the failure that I went through to be the person I am today. That's how I needed to learn. I have to learn the hard way. But I always think about like, how yeah. could I have stopped myself? Did I need to get kicked off of two teams? I would have been a different position. I would have been like, things would have been different for me. You know, like, could I have found a way to really balance? Like, yeah, you're in college. You want to have some drinks with your friends. Maybe you want to get drunk sometimes. Like, you're going to do some shit like that. But like, does it need to be every day? Do you need to now be doing like harder drugs? Do you need to be like, I really wish I would have. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that I wish I could have like. I am having a hard time exactly trying to pinpoint what I want to say. I just feel like there's a group of kids, there's a group of people, maybe even listening to this where it's just like, they don't think they're, they think they got it, you know? And God, mm -hmm. I would, I would love to find a way to get through to that kid. And what I think about is how could I have gotten through to me? And is there anything in your life or, or now that you're getting older too, that you look back and you're like, I wish I would have done this different, or I wish I could have got through. This is how I would get through to the younger version of me now. Yeah. I mean, I, w one of the things I'll lead off with, I think the epitome of human existence is being like, ah, damn, I wish I did that. Or, ah, damn. I wish I was able to see the way that my dad was talking about this, this girl, whatever, that was just a complete mm. toxic failure for four years of my life. Mm. But damn, I, in that moment, didn't see any of that. Wasn't having any of those conversations. Wasn't, you know, wasn't even close to being like, oh, hmm, maybe you're right. It was like, no, dude, I'm a kid. I'm going to say, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And that's the, and that's, maybe that's a personal thing. Maybe that's whatever. But I, I have a feeling that a lot of the kids, a lot of kids in general nowadays have this idea and develop this idea that they're kind of going to go through their experiences. And the hardest part about try like, like for you and also for me, I really wish that I was able to convince myself to take the weight room seriously way before I actually did. I really wish I could, I could have done that and or shifted away from the partying and, and cause that, that, that stuff really took a toll um, and or didn't provide anything because I didn't, I didn't care about the weight room until I was 20 really at all. It was like a waste of time for me. Um, and so I think that kids 
from my perspective, my, my being myself, there was nothing that I could have ever heard from. Like what, exactly what you said. There's nothing I could have ever heard from anybody that was like, you're right. I need to shift something. Nothing. No one was. How do you get through to, through to that kid, dude? How do you get through to young TJ and young Tay, dude? Yeah. I, and and I, I've, I've spent hours thinking about that and as well as like, dude, what, doing the whole what if thing. Man, what if I took the, the weight room serious at, at 16? Well, what, what, what could I be now? You know, what could I, what could have happened? What, what would that have shifted from my college career? And then, and then that probably would have shifted me away from the whole partying scene and all this stuff. What would my reputation be now? You know, like all of these things. And it's just, it's the, the never ending cycle of experiencing things. And then going four years in the future and be like, ah, damn, I really wish I did that. That's the epitome of the human existence. And so the hard part about that is, under, is when you truly understand that is there is a time and place where someone just got to learn the hard way. Yeah. You wouldn't be the person you are today without learning the hard way. I wouldn't be the person I am today without learning the hard way. Some pe- very few people are very fortunate enough to be in that moment. And be like, hmm, something's got to shift. And I don't know what it is, but we got to shift something. And they shift it and, it. and it works out. And it's like, man, really happy I did that. Yeah. You know, and it has a lasting effect <laughs> and like immediate change. And that's, that's the hard part about thinking of ways to get through to those kids. Either the Tay or the TJ or, you know, random Johnny over here. It's just, it's difficult to. Un- Johnny like, Buckets. Johnny Buckets. That's what it was. <laughs> Johnny Buckets to really like have that that acupuncture into his brain to be like, whoa, something's going on. I need to shift something. You know, I, I need to plant this seed in my mind that I really love the, the, the weight room or plant this into my mind that I really need to start eating healthier because it's for the long run of my body, it's, the benefits are through the roof. You know, and, and as a kid, as a person who definitely thought that I was invincible, you weren't going to tell me a I thing. Know. I mean, dude, it's... It's the thing you said you put hours into thinking about. So have I, man. I feel you. You know, it's like, and that's where, you know, I st- I've like softly started. You won't as like, it'll ever become something I would love to. But that was the, that was like the concept that I learned in college where it was kind of like, that's how I get myself is just like, you won't like, go ahead, keep partying, dude. Go ahead. I'm not going to be your mom or your coach that tells you, oh, you shouldn't do that. Or like, look at this guy. Look how he turned. Like, that's not, I'm like, go ahead, dude, go ahead. And I say it with this like smirk of like, cause you're going to burn out. And that's what happened with me. It's like, I burned out. And I also got put in like a life death situation that forever, like made me realize at a young age, like, Oh, this is my priority. Now I've seen, I've died and I'm, I'm being reborn. And it's like, I don't want to go back there again. I don't want to be in that mm-hmm. position again, you know? And, and I think it will forever be my quest to find the best way to get through the younger version of me. And uh, I just, I know that you shared something similar and you and I connect in that way. And I think that's why I've always felt like something special just with you as a person is because I don't think everyone is that way. And sometimes I like talk about this ad nauseum on like podcast on, on my podcast, like talking about this side of things, like everyone's like me, they're probably not dude. I bet most kids aren't this way. Um, yeah. It's like, I'm fascinated with thinking about like, how can I get through to that kid? Because the kids who, you know, don't struggle with like let's say or don't feel like they have that addictive personality or whatever hopefully they're like uh they have a more they live you know it's i actually work with a therapist and right now we talk a lot about like that life comes in waves life is like waves you know and it's like uh here's the range for like healthy like healthy highs healthy lows but you live in this and for those of you who are just listening it's like i'm just my hands are about like let's say a foot apart and you live within this range ebbs and flows right and how i think because I went from volleyball, like hardcore competitive. Now we're maybe above the line. It's very high to like even partying. It was like, I went very high. Or for example, like when I smoked weed, it was like, I loved relaxing. And so it's like, why just watch a movie when I could be stoned and watch a movie? It's like everything was Mm -hmm. super high or super low. And so I wasn't really good at just living in that medium of like, I'm just sober with my friends or watching a movie. This is great. It's like, I always wanted to be like, but it could be better, you guys. (laughs) <laughs> you know, let's take these edibles and it'll be better, you know, yeah. like I, or like whatever it was, dude, or the same where it was like, like, we're going to party. Let's like, let's go out. Let's stay out all night. Let's like go do this thing. Like I was just so, uh, I had so much energy where it was like super high or super low. And now as an adult, I look back and it's like, I don't regret the things I did as a kid. Got it. It's developed me into who I am today. And I'm so proud of how far I've come, but it's more, can I be comfortable just living in this zone and not above or below the like optimal levels of highs and lows for humans to just exist in. Like that's the, the, the optimal 
uh, levels for us to just be, you know, you have a little bit of happiness, a little sadness, and it's not like super highs and super lows. And now it's the thing as an adult, I struggle with because now you're out here alone in Poland and you know, cause you're out here alone in Poland too, where it's like, what do I do? What do I want to do when it's just chill time? It's hard for me to just like, I'm just going to watch a show. You know, that like older version of me exists where it's like, or <laughs> you could take 10 tabs of acid. No, I'm just kidding. I never did that. By the way. That's a joke. <laughs> but like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like now it's a thing I struggle with as an adult and I'm constantly looking for healthier resources or people who, who maybe have gone through the same thing. And that's hopefully what this is. I want to be able to provide that space for maybe people who do feel the same, the younger version of me, or even adults, other professionals who maybe feel that like, uh, just normal existing isn't enough. Do you, do you get that? Am I like, maybe I'm alone in this, bro. I don't know. I've talked to no, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 a lot of the things you said definitely resonated with me. And, but I had a, what you mentioned about um, living in those waves in those zones and understanding that that's what makes you um, in the future. That's kind of what has developed you into the, into the person you are today. I think that is a very potentially could be a very valuable mindset to try to plant in the seed of a young person's mind. Like the, the idea and the understanding that whatever is kind of going through now is very rudimentary and almost, you know, sounds stupid to be like, that's what this is going to have an effect on how you grow up and like how, what, what, uh, um, what you kind of develop into. Um, but you take it another layer deeper of like, okay, so you're, you're going to support this, do this partying thing. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. That's great. But it's like having them, th understand the mindset of that's going to translate into something else that's or not something else that's going to translate into the same thing and down the road and having that understanding of growth and placement and uh environment of what you wish you're around you know the you're you're a product of the five closest friends you you hang out with that's like what's kind of forms you in your shell and that's what you kind of decide to end up doing um you, you, you surround yourself with people that go to the weight room and do all that stuff. There's a probable, a high, high probable chance you're going to shift into that as well and kind of adopt some of these mindsets. And, and I know it's way easier to just sit here across the, the camera and talk about it, but it ha that could be maybe something that th those parents out there can use as a, as a tool to not, because by, by no means is that telling a kid, Hey, I'm telling them anything. And because that's, that's when you get your first initial reaction of a knee jerk and be like, Hey, I'm, I'm not going to listen to you is when you, you end up trying to tell the kid something. But if it's like, hey, just so you know, and the idea of whatever the kind of environment you're in now is going to translate and have some sort of effect later down the road. And like, you know, more and more times than not, you're going to look back and be like, ah, darn, you know, wish it, wish it was a little bit different. Wish it was like it was able to shift in some way, hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, my, honestly, I don't think my parents could have told me any of that. And I would have been like, oh, it's going to affect me in the future. Like, I'm sure, dude, I'm going to be freaking 20 forever, mom. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't really explain it very well. But yeah, yeah. No, you right. did, dude. TJ, you did. I think it's what all I can imagine. It's what a lot of parents struggle with when they recognize they have a kid who's like doesn't want to be told what to do and like gonna live life on his own terms and figure it out. And I feel personally like one of the luckier ones, and that's why I'm trying now to publicly be honest with the world about who I was and how I've changed and what I can do to help. Uh, <clears throat> because I can imagine it's tough, you know. When I look at me, mm -hmm. I, I I feel so grateful to have the family I did who was so supportive. My parents are amazing people. Um, but I also feel for them now as an adult where I'm like, dang, I uh, feel like maybe I put them through more than they signed up for. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> or like I was a lot to handle and they handled it so well, you know, and, uh, you know, to have a family for me, at least that was so supportive while I was kind of like, you know, calling my parents and telling them I'm getting kicked off a team and I had to tell them again, like, for being a party kid basically it was like my parents two beautiful christian people who were like oh okay <laughs> like, <laughs> who, who i didn't feel like i could relate to you know who i didn't feel like i could relate to about sex or drugs or what was going on in my mind things i was experiencing in college i didn't feel like i could have those conversations with my parents and so i had them with like-minded friends you know so mm -hmm. it wasn't like i had this ex this this person to look up to like a mentor or someone who was like for me a good figure of just like look at this guy's freaking loves volleyball he's a professional he's balling out and uh you know, he also went through some of that stuff, but look at him. And that's, I feel like now that's what I'm, I'm trying to provide to, to younger kids as well is like, maybe there's another way to deliver that message. That's not, uh, 
So I want us to start with gratitude and sit here and like, you know, which I do yeah. think practicing gratitude is amazing. The science will definitely support it. I just mean like, maybe there's another way. That's what I'm constantly searching for. Let's not bring gotcha. it. This is, this is too much about me. I'm so sorry for everyone listening. I really, I really am. This has nothing to do with me and I apologize. I'm being very <laughs> selfish. It's a terrible tendency. Um, okay. I do like kind of like squeaking out of that a little bit. I do want to know like, uh, what are your, like, what are your blocks? You know, do you, do you have things that like, what are the things that make you like, I don't know, feel like an outcast or feel weird or do you get what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I think so. I think I just explained mine, like the things that made me feel like alienated in some way now as an adult, especially where it's like, I got to learn how to just like be a normal guy going through earth, you know, like, I'm so curious, yeah. like what, what are the things that now you now feel like are the things that are, you know, make you feel weird or are your blocks? Yeah. Um, I, maybe I'm not understanding. I'll, I'll talk about something that I, I think could maybe be uh, related. What do you to struggle topic? with now as an adult? Just, it doesn't even have to be, we'll get to some volleyball stuff here in a little bit too, but I'm just like, what are some things that you just think like you struggle with as an adult right now? You're living in Poland all alone. Yeah. And you and I had yeah, a lot but- of these talks last year when we lived together and I don't mean to like make this a pity party or we're all dealing with whatever, but I think it's really important, dude. I think, you know, you and I had a lot of conversation about like, I mean, I would flip the camera right now, but it's like, guess what? Weather check gray. Currently <laughs> snow, so snow is nice, but like cold and gray back to you, Bob. And then tomorrow is the yeah. same weather report. And like, it can be hard. It can be hard if you can feel alone. And so I just was curious for you. Are there things that like, what do you currently feel like you're struggling with? Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, that that is a much clearer explanation. I, this I, is a safe definitely... space, TJ. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> I noticed and recently actually had this thought this morning while I, I was kind of under. Uh, I knew that this uh, we're going to do the podcast and this this talk was going to happen and all this stuff was, dude. I am very much addicted to technology. Like I sat, I woke up this morning at nine. 30 9 45 something like that and sat on my couch drink a coffee and scroll through tiktok for hours because simply there was nothing that grabbed my attention more other than that and better to do hmm. and that is one of the things that i'm definitely struggling with is i'll go through like what you said the ebbs and flows of life and i'll have one week one and a half weeks where i'll, I'll, I'll get up i'll clean i'll make the bed i'll do this i'll make some breakfast i'll get in the shower i'll come out i'll, I'll read some books i'll, I'll read a book that i have I'll, I'll do some journaling, all this stuff. And I'm like, yes, fucking love it. And then I'll go through a, a four week full ebb of like, ah, I'm going to sit on TikTok. I'm going to play some video games. I'm going to try to distract my mind from not being, from not, you know, being in that state of mind of like, dude, I'm alone in Poland in this house in the middle of the snow field and it's gray and I don't want to go outside and I blah, 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 all this stuff. Hmm. Cause, and that's what I, one of the biggest things about being a professional athlete, because you talk to however many kids, or, or even adults are like, dude, everyone, there's 50,000 people in America that, that would kill for your position. It's like, yeah, well, the, the idea of just purely playing overseas and getting paid to play volleyball, great, love it. You guys have no idea what it's like to be out in a country, gray outside, snowing, cold, a small city, and you don't speak the language, you can't go outside, and you're here for eight months. Like What's you don't know all the different struggles and all that kind of stuff. It, it, like what, what I was mentioning was like figuring out ways to constructively feel like I'm actually accomplishing something. Hmm. Cause I mean, I'll go through weeks at a time where it's like, dude, I, I went to practice. I did my job. I came home, I ate lunch. I took a nap. I went to practice, came home, drew, had some beers, went to sleep, woke up, went to practice, came home, made lunch, take a nap. Yeah. Like the same mundane routine every day. And it's like, dude, I, I, I've been I've been a literal robot for the past three weeks. Nothing significant really triggered my mind to store some memory in there. Nothing in the cerebellum was like, "Hey, this is kind of cool. Let's let's remember this and remember how this felt and store all this data." It's like, nah, dude. I've been a robot. Everyone has probably experienced. Have you ever experienced driving and you're driving down like a relatively straight path or whatever, and you're and you you're just sitting there driving, just chilling, and then all of a sudden you realize like, was that light green back there? Did, oh, I, did I did I run through that light? 
hundred percent. I'll be honest. I freaking love long drives, dude. As much as I hate being in the car, I definitely empathize with that though, for sure. Where you're just like, wait, was I just driving? <laughs> dude, I have to do yeah. it all the time. Yeah, for sure. That's hilarious. That That is exactly how I felt I feel on, on this ebb and flow basis of like, I'll go through four weeks of that. I was like, dude, I just did nothing with my life. Sure, I went to volleyball and tried to continue to perfect my craft and, and, and lifting and eating and all this kind of stuff. It's like, dude, I had nothing happened in my life in the last four weeks, you know? And that's when it gets really sad and almost like in the depressing field for me. It's like, dude, how long are we going to let this go? Mm. How long are we yeah. just going to kind of sit here and <laughs> keep allowing ourselves to just sulk further and further and further into this, this metaphorical seat that we're in of just mm. sh- uh, shit, you know? Do you, uh, let's just, I I personally have recently been going through, like I had said, I'm I'm working through learning how to stop being so high or so low and just try to find a space in the middle. And I I said something to my, the other day where I was like, I feel like sometimes I'm just waiting to be fully happy, you know? Like I'm waiting to just be like my old self. And when I think of old self, I think of like the college kid who like had no real responsibilities. And it's like, I mean, I lived in Hawaii, you know? So, and I love the sun. So for me, it was like, I woke up and I went to weights and then I went to Sandy's and went body surfing, and hung with my friends. And then we went to training and then like we had some beers or we hung out and like life was just like, it just kept going. And it was just so much fun. And like, I loved that. And, and on one hand, it's like, you get older, you get more responsibility, things change. And on the other hand, I, I, I think like, I believe happiness is so much perspective and it's something I struggle with because I'm like, why can't I find happiness here in Poland? And I'm not grim. I'm not like super depressed all the time, but I get feelings like that all the time. Or it's Mm. like, you wouldn't know it on the surface, like interacting with me, but like, and I, oh man, I hope I don't fucking cry because it feels, it's so, it's so true to me, you know? Mm. Uh, But um, I get moments where I'm just like, whoa like huge flows within like an hour where i'll be like dude like an hour ago i like got so overwhelmed by all the potential that could be or by thinking about like god why don't i go play in like freaking indonesia would i be happier there if i can like the sun's out and i can surf and like it's different and it's new and i love novelty and and then i think all the time it's like or why can't i continue to build these tools and to build other things around me the podcast has been great for me but like building things to allow me to, to really recognize that happiness is such a perspective and then also find the balance because it's like, you know, is that, do I need to sacrifice coming to Poland? Do I need to sacrifice playing somewhere else maybe for less money or something because I can still do the thing I love, but at the same time, it's like, I, maybe I, it is, I know this about myself that like, Hey, it's helpful for me to have a community. It's helpful for me to like have some sun to go outside, you know, and like, and that's a a bio, like a biological thing. Not having the sun definitely, I think causes a lot of, um, I don't know, unwarranted depression, maybe, um, like low vitamin D, even though I supplement, like, I think maybe there's something there also. Um, but you know, I, I, so when I, I think about for you, it's like, so what's, what's our solution? Cause you and I struggled with this, I think together last year also just have, having times and it's not all the time. And when you're traveling up for volleyball or like when we, ha- because we had each other, we had Rob, we had good friends. It, it, it makes it, um, some days are a lot easier than others. Um, but like, what is the ultimate solution? Because I believe like perspective is so much of where inner peace and happiness lies you know and it's an old way it's like a conditioning that i've had for myself where it's like no happiness is uh pleasure and the things that give me pleasure used to give me pleasure was like uh drugs uh, hanging out with people who were like minded uh the sun surfing like okay but what about when those things don't exist can i still find inner peace you know yeah yeah um one of the things that resonated definitely was the the idea of perception um and that like i mean we had a lot of those conversations last year of how am i perceiving my situation right now is my life terrible no getting paid a lot of money to play in this beautiful country with a great you know atmosphere of volleyball and all this kind of stuff great you know living in a house by myself which is beautiful and and taking in all these details is really great does my life suck no why am i sad yeah i don't understand it you know yeah. and and w- w- also what you mentioned about, you know, having you there last year and having Robbie and, and having these people to rely on. One of the things that I'm slowly learning about being here in this new city that I'm in and this new team and all the, and, and everything like this is, oh, I definitely feel very strongly about the connection that we had last year because that was 
the biggest thing for me because I, and looking for like what you said, the, the distraction to understand the different perception of what's going on. I searched for distraction and my distraction last year was connection with you and connection with Robbie and the times we'd get to go out and we, we went to lunch five times a week. You know, we went to lunch cheap out here, baby. Lunch, dinner, you know, we live in like Kings out here, baby. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, that food was cheap, dude. I'll tell you that much. That's what I'm saying, dude. <laughs> but the, one of the best things about that whole, um, the collection of happiness last year for me was connection with you yeah, and connection and, you know, a human, human interaction, because that yeah. in itself is a distraction from whatever it is you're kind of going through. When you sit in this mundane self and you're just kind of sitting in this chair and it's like, I mean, in the world we grow up now and, and now today is all about distractions. God forbid there's no distractions, you know, Instagram, Twitter, uh, TikTok, uh, this, uh, I got this many likes, I got this comments, uh, there's videos are posting, uh, da, 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 da. It, our life all today is about distraction. Mm. So now it becomes, which is one of the things that is very apparent is we sit here and in, in our space, and if we sit here for 10 minutes, it's like, dude, this is the longest 10 minutes of my life. When can I go do something else? And so being, and the, one of the things that I'm, I'm experiencing this year a lot is maybe not having a, a very close friend on the team that I can go hang out with and, and go to lunches with and do all this stuff. I'm 80% of the time here, I'm alone in this house. And so it's, hit, it hit, it's been hitting me hard of like, okay, I'm alone in this house, beautiful house, wonderful, like um, everything about it. But I don't have any distractions for me. So I'm going to go to TikTok. I'm going to go to Instagram. I'm going to do this. I'm going to play video games for seven hours a day. When I come home, I'm going to do that. I'm going to sulk. I'm going to try to get into those, those, those flows, ebbs and flows of like, oh, I'm for this next week, I'm going to read a book. And then just sink right back down into the same thing. You know, it's been, been incredibly difficult. Yeah. Uh, side note, you said you're living in a house. Daddy's also living in a house. We're living lavishly. And I'll say of any professional players, you and me are doing it right. And this is a pro tip for those professional players playing overseas. Guess what? You don't just have to take the apartment they give you. What I did, and I think what you did as well, is you ask, hey, what's the budget you have for an apartment? And this is advanced, maybe a few months before you get there. You say, what's the budget for the apartment? They give you a budget. Go on Airbnb, go on Verbo, send everyone messages. Guess what? A lot of them, you're coming in there in their dark season, October to you know end of April. They don't have anyone to really rent to, depending on what city you're in. And you, a lot of times, can find amazing deals. That's what you did. That's what I did. That's why we're living in big houses. That's why we're both sad that we're in these big houses and we don't have families in them. And there's no other friends or people to share them with. Just kidding. But that just that's a side note for any pros who are playing overseas. Uh, guess what? We're not paying a ton of money. I'm, not, I'm barely paying anything out of pocket just to live in this, like uh, the abundance of this house. It's been an amazing, it definitely changed the experience last year. You know, I was living in basically a jail cell <laughs> that I was paying extra for too, which is hilarious. But uh, <laughs> anyways, that, that's just for those... Um, I, I, it blows my mind that a lot, a lot of players don't know that you can do that and that there's really easy ways that don't take a lot of energy to like find a place that you'd be more comfortable living. And when you're in Poland to that point, it's like, it's helpful to have a space that you feel really comfortable in, especially because you're going to spend a lot of time indoors, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I, 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 I hear you. And, and so let, let me ask you then, uh, what do you think is the most, when it comes to like decision-making on, what club to play for, like these little things. What do you think is like, where do you draw the line between like, uh, there's like, here's what I think about, this is kind of a fun random conversation. Like when, when it comes to decision-making, here's like the, the pools uh, or the, I think of it like a pie chart. And it's like, okay, part of the pie is uh, money. Part of the pie is uh, like, who's gonna be the coach? Who's going to be the team? What's the organization of the club like? What's the history? Is it like a, a good club in the league? Are they like going to win? Or are they just like some, you know, mid-level, lower-level club, but in a good league? Uh, yeah, what's the league like? What's the environment like? Like, what's the weather like? Where are you geographically? Like, where do you, uh, what are your like bigger parts of the pie there, you know? Yeah, uh, so probably the first three you mentioned was definitely the money. Um uh the the personnel uh related to the team that means players coaching staff potentially if, if it's a if it's a club that i previously had interactions with or something like that the society the society is a big one because they can they pull a lot of the strings behind the puppet show um and so if you don't have a very good society or a healthy relationship with them or they're um very narcissistic it can be it can lead to negative things that turn up in the worst times that aren't very uh helpful um 
I, I don't really mind the location very much. I'll go a lot of different places. It, it doesn't, that doesn't really, I don't mind that so much. Um, the next one is probably, uh, you know, what the league is like. Obviously, there's only a couple of options, really, in terms of my uh, acceptance for the league. What are they? Um, Italy, Poland, and, and Russia. You know? So, those are the top three, um, top four things that I would say are the biggest po- the pieces of, of the pie. Let it, level let of volleyball, it. I guess, is another one. The level of, of which the team plays at is a big one. To, uh, that kind of goes with the personnel thing. Yeah, and and that matters too because well, and this is the part I'm really interested in now because now for those of you who don't know, you're on you're the best club in the league. Rizovia, you guys are leading the league right now, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you're playing on a team where you got a ton of ballers on that team. And I want to know the difference to you, and I've experienced this as well. Like choosing to be on a team where you're, and for those maybe who are in college, maybe you don't get to choose all the time, but especially as a professional, like. Uh, choosing to be on a team where you're going to be more of the guy as compared to now. And I, for me, I think about it more like national team, like on the national team, it's so much more balanced because, you know, it's like you, Aaron Russell, Dave Smith, Mike, like there's so many stars, so many good players, you know, where it's like, it's not like when you're pro overseas and I've played on teams before where it's like, uh, for me, I think about, I need a good center because I'm mainly an offensive middle. And so I need to be getting 15 balls a game. And so it's like, if I'm on a team, for example, <laughs> we won't go too deep here, but uh, when you and I played together last year, part of the reason I love you and hated you as well is because you were so freaking good. Daddy didn't get set as many balls and I couldn't show what I can do. Whereas like we had, a, we had you and we had an opposite who were like, you were the, maybe the best outside hitter in the league last year. And our opposite, uh, Butrin was maybe the best opposite in the league last year. So it's like, you guys are getting most of the balls and rightfully so you were doing a good job with them. You know, but like, for example, it's so different now, now that you're gone, it's like, there are certain games where I get to be the leader and I get, Mm -hmm. I get set tons of balls that when you were here, I didn't get that. And so it's, and to me, it's like such, it's different style of play. So I'm curious, how does that work for you now where, and you're still balling out, obviously, and you're going to be the guy for the rest of your life. But what is it, what is the difference like between playing on a team where you're the guy and let's say for you, especially that's like in college where like, you're the guy, you're getting set tons of balls. They're relying on you to basically win the game as compared to now you're on a team where like, you guys are pretty balanced. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's definitely a mentality shift and an acceptance and an awareness of said facts that uh, you can't, you can't be so selfish anymore because there's other guys that can do their job. There's other guys that can, um, you know, help the team out in these different ways. And there's, there's, parts of the game that is like a little bit of a step back and like i don't need 20 30 balls you know if, if these guys are doing their job of killing the ball i'm, I'm good with reception give me a couple of balls to kind of keep me in the game whatever and then, then that's we, whatever is and then it shifts into the mindset of whatever we can do as a team to win that that's what we're kind of going for um and that is definitely a big shift from, from last year because last year was like dude give me every single ball i'll kill as many as i can and i'll, I'll do my job mm. but now this year is like what what do, what do we got to do as a team to win and do you, do you like that dynamic or do you kind of miss sometimes being more of the guy like, uh, you know, like th- they're different people in some way, you know, like in, in some way it's like, yeah, when you're on a team where everyone's good, it's like, you probably don't get as frustrated with the dumb plays that happen. Like free ball gets passed over, or like little things that maybe when you're on a lower level team, those mistakes happen a little bit more that are so frustrating. Um, mm-hmm. And then at the same time, it's like, you know, I could imagine there's times where you're like, I miss being said every ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know that 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 comes with the with the the cocky set of um, what is the what was I trying to say? The the nature that I want to be able, to, I want to do what I what I do best. Like give me the give me the ball, give me the chances. I I'll, I'll I'll put us on the back and I'll take us. Mm. You know, have that trust in me because just just let me do it. You know, kind of thing. And there, there's a li- little bit of missing that every once in a while, but then it, that kind of has kind of shifted for me into, all right, dude, well, let's all get in the backpack together and go wherever. And maybe it's me one match and maybe it's Mazi the, Muzai the next match. Maybe it's Kohanowski the next match, you know, like let's all figure out ways to help each other. And if someone's having that night, let's hop in their backpack, mm. you know, let's do, let's be okay with, you know, because all, a lot of the names on my team are freaking superstars. 
you know, well, very well-known players. And so mm. any one of us, if, and if we all have a great night together, it's great. We're hopping in the center's backpack, you know, and, and, and if there's one guy that's ha- struggling a little bit, this guy's going to kind of help me out a little bit. And then he, maybe he gets it going and then we're going to hop in his backpack and it's like, I'm going to do my job to pass the ball. We're going to get him the ball. That's how we're going to win this game. Or we're both, you know, we're, we're going back and forth with each other's backpacks. It's like, great. Then that, that's, that's kind of the night it is. And so it's, it's definitely a huge shift in my mindset of being okay with not getting every ball. But mm-hmm. I mean, like you said, of course, there's sometimes where it's like, dude, I really wish I had 45 balls and went for a 30 point game. Really wish that, but not the case anymore. Uh, when you were saying that, I was literally, my brain went all Donkey Kong, dude. And I was thinking like, I just pictured uh, like six kangaroos on the court. And then, like, someone starts balling off and everyone starts just, like, trying to jump into his pouch, you know? And everyone, you got this big pouch full of all your buddies, you know, carrying them with you. <laughs> no, that's cool. Dude, let me, let me ask you then. Like, what do you feel like you're what – what are you working on right now? Like, just in your own game. Like, what are you trying to work on right now? Yeah, uh, working, trying to work a lot on serving because I don't know what happened from last year. It's dipped a lot in, 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 in my proficiency bar and my own acceptance for how I've been serving. Ooh, excuse me. Um, see, my brain knows it's nap time. I have a day off. Hey, hey, we're gonna like, we're gonna wrap up here. We're gonna wrap up here soon, anyways, baby. Don't worry. You're gonna get that nice. <laughs> that wasn't the point. <laughs> uh, but what do you mean serving? Yeah, the trying to figure out what has been because go- there's sometimes in in the ebbs and flows of volleyball that sometimes it just isn't work isn't going your way. There's some days you wake up and you're like, dude, I feel great. I can do anything. I want with the ball. I can feel, I feel it, you know, all this kind of stuff. Jumping really well. I see the game, reacting like a cat, you know, doing all this stuff. And then there's other days, it's like, Dude, what are we doing? Dude, that's a famous noise by TJ, by the way. I love that you just did that. <laughs> do it one more time for me. Do it one more time for everyone. Which one? The... <laughs> there it is, dude. <laughs> but, so I'm, I'm truly trying to dig into that and figure out what has changed so much. Well, what is it? Is it, is it my toss? Is it my approach? Is it, I'm getting too far behind the ball. Is it my shoulder issue that I've been having to, um, to just, I'm trying to change things and use different parts of my body to serve. Like, what is it really? And I'm really trying to dive into that. Right how now. do you, how do you manage, uh, thinking like being methodical about changes you want to make and overthinking something? Because when I hear you talking about that, it makes me laugh where I'm like, sometimes dude, the joke for me has been like a morning serve and pass before a game. I'm like, the first three serves are just like ace, like solid serves. I'm just like, I don't miss in the morning. I'm like, I always make jokes like, just watch when the game comes. I'm going to brick like the first three serves, dude. And it happens yeah. to me all the time where I'm like, this doesn't make any sense what's going on. And, uh, and then I get into that, like, oh, maybe I need to focus more. Today, I'm going to focus more on, like, contacting the ball higher. This time, I'm going to focus more on my step closer. This time, I'm going to focus more on, like, tossing it up more to my left or whatever it is. Um, where do, how do you manage the, like, the, the reality that may be sometimes this is the ebbs and flows of life. We have the same in volleyball where sometimes it's like, hey, just keep showing up and being intentional and doing your best. And you're sometimes going to serve great and sometimes not. Like, where do you find the balance between being, like, let's let it go. We're all right. And then also being like, or do I need to change this? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a huge point. Um, and as soon as you mentioned all that, the one, the first thing that came to my mind was actually a teaching from Alan Knight um, in long, at long beach was there is always a basics in everything we do in volleyball. There's a basics, like first, like a checklist of three things. What are the first, what are the, give me your first basic, very like rudimentary. You're teaching a fucking baby how to serve steps for serving well if i'm teaching a baby first thing we got to do we got to get you from crawling to walking so that's going to take a couple years i'm going to ask you to be patient um no what what do you mean you mean basics like what is my personal checklist or how would i start teaching how would i teach a kid no like okay so i'll 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 I'll, I'll give you an example and then i'll ask you three so okay one of the things that alan really would preach every single day was that there's three things the three, three basic things to a serve your feet your toss and your arm swing. And the biggest, the biggest one for me is my feet. So when, <laughs> when I'm starting my approach, as long as my, my approach is slow to fast and I'm attacking the ball on the way up, then that is what the very rudimentary basic thing of, of serving from my brain. The next thing 
is where I, I'm, I'm not just going to run sideways and the ball's over there. Uh, obviously, I'm going to have an approach towards the ball and I'm where the location of the ball is according to my arm. Mm-hmm. Um, then that, that's the next part. And the next part is where, then where my contacting point is. You know, if my feet, I'm good with my feet, slow to fast, walking on eggshells in the beginning and then going to a, last, a really hard last uh, step close, last two steps in directional pace and, and, and then, then I'm able to put myself in a good position my shoulder and the toss is good and everything like that, then it's – so what, where I'm going with this is the, the one thing that he really taught really well when you're going through a serving funk is just return to the basics. Go back. Go way back before you – you know, when you remember how, how, starting to learn how to serve. Get your feet right. Make sure you're in a good position. And then go from there. Um, I, first of all, totally agree with that. I, in fact, for my own serving right now, because I, I switched to this like five step hybrid toss that I love a lot. And the nice part about it, the, the part that I'm working on now is my brain recognizing when I need to float it, when I need to roll it and when I need to go for it. And mm-hmm. it's happened so quick, right? It's like, you don't really know. I mean, you maybe sometimes I'll know if it's like a really low toss or it's really high as I'm moving, like, uh, But a lot of the times it's like I jump and as I'm jumping, I'm like now having to recognize, do I float it because it's a little too far in front of me? Do I roll it because it's a little far behind me or a little bit behind me? Or do I go for it because it's right in the money zone and it's whatever and I drive through the ball? Um, And uh, so I think like that's that's that checklist is like, yeah, I mean, those are the three components, the like three basic components of serving a ball, like the technique for serving a ball. So my thought for you is like, where do you find, where do you manage getting back to the basics? And then in two days you have a game because in season, it's like you have a game depending on the team or league or whatever. You have a game either every kind of three or four days or like at least once a week. And so it's like maybe in practice, it's like, okay, today's practice. We're going to focus on the fundamentals of like my feet or whatever it is, the eggshells to then, you know, hard step close in the direction you're trying to go. And then how do you manage now you're in a game let's say first serve you miss, where's your mind? Where, where do you go? Do you try to go back to the fundamentals in the game? Do you try to just say, I, I don't want to think about any of this, like good toss, go bad toss, put it in. Like, where do you, where does your mind go in a match? Yeah. And that, that time frame it goes a lot about feel like in the match. If I'm, if I miss it, miss the first one, miss the second one. It's like, okay, I'm not really feeling very much connection. That's the perfect time for myself to go back and be like, all right, now let's hit the basics again. Let's slow everything down, get our feet right. Don't have to pound the ball. Let's, let's get our feet right first, feel the rhythm, try to get something going and find that, like I said, the rhythm, try to get that rhythm back into your game. And I, I think it doesn't matter when, when, you, uh, when you tell yourself to go back to the basics because you're always, you, random times are going to come up when you're in the funk. Random times. It could also could happen maybe with like a re-blocking situation for you. You're like, you're starting to get a little lazy, <laughs> jumpy. You, they, they did this the last play. They did this two plays ago. They're starting to feed the opposite. He's starting to get going. Let's just, let's just relax and let's calm everything down and truly read as opposed to getting antsy with, you know, our track record of what's going on in our brain. Same thing with serving. We're getting antsy. Oh, dude, the guy, two guys before me missed serve. I got to make the serve. And all of a sudden, I, uh, I got to I, I be able to put one in. Or I got to cause some pressure because in this league, you can't really score real points without causing some pressure and, like, you start thinking about all these things. That's when it's a great time. It's like, dude, let's go back to the basics real quick. Let's take a second. It, it could be two or three seconds. And this is why you're doing your server team, you're bouncing the ball. All right, I'm going to work on my, I'm going to make sure my feet are as explosive as possible. And we're going to, we're going to figure it out from there. Or mm-hmm. I'm going to sit here in my reading position and I'm going to, I'm going to take in all the signs that I know how to take in. And I'm going to allow myself to patiently take in. Setter's here, ball setter, ball. Okay, the setter's doing this with the sand. Okay, this is the read. You know, I think the hardest, at least one of the hardest things for me when I think about uh, like what are maybe some of my blocks for uh, the things that I struggle with when it comes to in-game volleyball stuff is uh, volleyball is really easy when you're in a flow state and the more flow you can be, the better, like anytime you think about great games you've had it. And this is like, um, this is not a new story for anyone, but the times where the best athletes in the world have played their best there, they would go back and say they were out, they played out of their mind, right? They were in such a flow state. And so I think about a lot of times those games where daddy ain't in a flow state, he's in a freaking flop state, you know, and I'm just flopping yeah. around like, I don't know, a dried seal. And I'm, I go back from like, uh, 
I'm thinking too much. And then maybe uh, I, I can't get to that place where I'm just one with what's going on. I have an, oh, an, I'm, I'm just like, you're just reacting without thinking about it. And that's where I struggle sometimes is, is I'm like, I started the game, not in a flow state. How can I get there? And so sometimes, you know, as a middle, I'm on the bench, um, you know, for half the game. And so sometimes it's like, if I'm not playing great or I feel like I'm thinking too much, it's like, can I do a simple breathing technique? And I have this little tattoo on my hand. And sometimes I just stare at it and just like focus on my breathing for like three breaths or a couple of breaths. And sometimes that works. And sometimes it's like, I can't get this guy to shut up and just be in this moment and play. And I always revert back to, to your point, let's just get tactical. And sometimes yeah. being like, consciously tactical tactical about things will actually allow you to like let's say maybe you don't have a whole game where you're in a flow and everything going but maybe the the fourth and fifth set it allowed you something because you went tactical it allowed you to flow for that last bit of time and and maybe you didn't have the best game of your life but you did when it counts like do you find yourself yeah. coming in and out of flow and like what tools do you have to like bring yourself back yeah i um I, i've definitely experienced the the coming out of the flow situation and being in the flow situation and like so understanding the difference there um but I, I i that's one of the i guess one of the things that i've been struggling with is continuing to because usually when i'm in the flow i'm in the flow and i'm, I'm set i feel that yep you know but then when i'm not in the flow like last night uh, we played a match against uh, um radham and i just wasn't in the flow at all and it was it was really tough for me to kind of get things going just because various different things were going on and it was just like I'm overstimulated and I can't focus and I want to think about this and my mind's telling me to go there and I know what I got to do. My muscle memory's kicking in, but my brain's telling, like freaking out, you know, so there's, it's, and that's the difficult part. And back when I, I used to, when I was a youth kid, I used to, youth kid, back when I was in the youth. Youth kid, love that. Uh, Let's stick with it. Youth kid. <laughs> I used to wear a rubber band and I would flick it, like kind of like what this, a little, like a cue, like your tattoo is for you. I would used to wear a rubber band and, and flick like some sort of jolting, like reset for the brain to be like, okay, let's, let's refocus here. Let's, let's get ourselves out of this funk and focus on the pain that I'm causing my wrist real quick. And let's just, let's just calm things down for a second. And that, that was one of the tactics that kind of helped for a little bit of a, a small period of time um, because it was a immediate kind of pain, pain sensation. It was like kind of like snapping out of it in, in a sense of like, Oh, okay. And, and that kind of proved to work a little bit, but then, the, then it got deeper and, um, but I, I don't really have a technique right now. And I, and that's something that I'm definitely working on. Mm. Yeah. And I can imagine it's like, that's a, it's a career long journey. And even really like when I think outside the court, it's a lifelong journey. You know, mm -hmm. it's the same when like, I feel depression or anxiety is the same idea. It's like, I'm thinking too much about this thing that isn't happening to me right now. A lot of times, mm -hmm. you know, and that, I think that's where sports is such a beautiful thing. It's like, there's so many correlations to, to the real world. And that's one of them. And sports puts you in volleyball specifically has, has always been like the arena where I'm actually learning a lot about me as a person. And it, it puts, it puts you on the spot to do that. And it's so nice where it's like, we're both high level professionals and damn, I still deal with it, bro. I still don't mm -hmm. have the form. I don't got the, I don't have the formula. And we all hear the same stories of like, there's different visualization techniques and meditation techniques and breath work stuff you can do. And I, I personally find it's helpful in a lot of ways, but it doesn't take away from the fact that we're all human and we all have games where it's just like, I'm like watching myself in third person. You ever had that experience or mm -hmm. feeling any like game in oh, particular yeah. where you remember where you're just like, ah, I literally feel like I'm just watching me right now. Uh, yeah. Well, we just lost to Lubin. Lubin. Mm. That uh, two games ago when we we played the one of the lower level teams we ended up losing in five. It was like I had really bad preparation that day from a sleep standpoint, from a um, recovery standpoint, from a uh, um, nutrition standpoint. And I came into this game and it was just it was the first time in a long time for me that I was actually uh, like negative eight points for the team, and it was just like dude, my brain was somewhere completely different. And I was just playing in a robot skin that I wasn't in control. It was very, a very interesting um, time in that during that game. It was weird. I can't imagine you minus eight, dude. I actually can't. I'm trying right now to imagine you not playing good, and it's actually hard for me. Yeah, it was wild. Wow. And uh, what happened? You finished the game, and then what? 
and then it was just like like so emotionally and physically and just fucked <laughs> just that I had no idea like I was wasn't angry wasn't I was obviously angry that we lost but like wasn't you know visibly angry it was just like just a mushroom it was like mm. didn't even know what to really do and it was like go to the locker room I went and took a shower and was just like had a beer it was just like I'm just gonna go to sleep mm. it was crazy well, luckily, then I can imagine, you know, life moves on. That is the nice part. That's the other interesting thing, right? It's like in a game where you're not playing good, you feel like it's it's like it is like a ancient lizard part of our DNA where it feels like survival, like life and death. You know, it's like, you know, sometimes for me, it can be because I also feel like I've been a little inconsistent with serving more than I'd like to the standard I have for myself. And uh, where I think then I'm thinking so much about it. And then the game's, you know, over and I'm just like, dude, why can't I just not think what, what is like, it'd be like, it, I almost like make it way more dramatic than it needs to be. And then luckily having enough experience, it's like, oh yeah, things move on, you know? Yeah. It, I, I noticed that first when I like played at Hawaii and like our senior year, we didn't, we didn't win a national championship, but we went to the NCAA for the first time in however long. And like, I was having an amazing season. We had a good team. And I'm just like, you know, in Hawaii too, it's like you sell out, you think you're going to be remembered forever because they yeah. just love volleyball in Hawaii is like something so special. And I'm so grateful for that time I had there. I loved it. Um, but, you know, now it's been eight years since college or something. And I look back and it's like, oh, no one knows who I am. <laughs> or who I am, dude. No one cares. And it's like, yeah. hey, it's kind of like a blessing, you know, to like, it's hard to keep it in mind as an athlete all the time, but just remembering like, guess what, dude, that game that you played terrible in that you're going to judge yourself for, it's like, no one's going to remember it 10 games from now, five games yeah. from now. And quite honestly, no one's going to remember it after the next game. But that also go, the humbling part is that also works for when you play really good. You have an amazing mm -hmm. game, you get MVP, whatever. And you just, you're on top of the world. We all know that feeling. And then the next game comes and maybe you don't play so good. And it's like, yeah, no one cares or remembers that you got MVP last match, you know? Yep. And uh, yeah. I think it just that all that all, all that messaging to me goes back to like, that's why it's important to find a way to live in here, to understand the process that that is progress, you know, and if you can find ways to continue to improve and, you know, for you just to hear that you have something to improve on or you want to improve on to me is just like so exciting to hear because externally, and I'm sure a lot of people see this when you play, it's just like, what are you going to tell TJ to improve on? I couldn't imagine being your coach, bro. Honestly, I couldn't imagine <laughs> I, I think about this all the time. Like who, who's coaching LeBron, dude? Like, what are you going to tell that guy? You know? Yeah. Um, but what it, what's humbling is like, it's also nice to know that even TJ has got shit. He's got to work on. And even TJ has moments where maybe he's not playing to the capability. He knows he can, or TJ has bad games, you know? Yeah. And for me, it helps 100%. me sleep. It helps me sleep at night knowing that you're a human being and not just a robot, dude, a farm robot. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, dude, last, last couple of thoughts here. First, I would, I'm really curious. Like, do you notice a big difference in dynamic, uh, being with the national team, who you are on the national team and who you are, uh, just when you play professionally overseas or are they pretty uh, sy symbiotic? I don't know. Um, I don't say there's a big difference of who I am. I think it more the one of the main differences would be like the the comfortability of the people that I play with on the national team that I've known for many years, as opposed to a guy that I'm just known for four or five months. Mm. You know, there's there's a certain level of except like maybe and for sure there's different levels of relationship that I have on the team now with these guys that I've known for five months. Different levels of um, feeling okay of like having some not not having some fear of conflict with some of them. And then the other one's just like, I don't really know you that well. So it's like, I mean, whatever, you know? Mm. Um, I think that's like the only thing that I would say is the difference is being on the national team is so great because everybody's not everybody for a long time. Maybe we don't get along the best. Maybe there's some different clicks here and there that we all kind of have our own our own wants and desires off the court, whatever. But on the court, was, we're all fighting for the same thing. Mm. We all speak the common language. You know, we're all in the same understanding. We all have the same mindset about volleyball and stuff. So it's like, I, that would be the only thing that I would see is like a, a difference. I got to be honest with you, dude. I've had enough talking about volleyball. Do you feel me on that? Are we done with volleyball? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, here's what I do want to, in, in closing, um, <clears throat> you're on the tattoo team now, dude. Look at you. Where, what, what happened to you, dude? It's like, uh, I haven't seen you dude, in you know, a couple months and you got almost a sleeve going on, dude. What's, what's going on? Where did that inspiration come from? 
<laughs> I know, dude. Look at me. I'm trying to be Taylor Abram without really knowing I'm trying to be Dude, Taylor not Abram. even. You're, that's hilarious. I, my goal is like, I don't know what I'm doing. I, to me, tattoos are just like fun postcards and like I'll regret. I already regret them all. That's the best part. Who cares? Um, <laughs> yours, yours are much more meaningful, which I love. <laughs> but uh, like, I'm like, dude, you got so much done in such a short amount of time. I'm like, I've been like, for some reason, I'm like, I'm only, I think, going to get tattoos on my left arm. And I have some special ones here and there. But <clears throat> like mainly on my on my left arm. And I'm like, still been like too lazy to like really kind of fill it out. And you're like on your way to like a full sleeve, bro. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, it kind of came, um, one of the, th the, the inspirations for all this was I really wanted to do something for my family and meaningful. And I wasn't going to just do a tattoo. Uh, I'm not saying it uh, towards you or anything like that. Well, I'm not just going to do a tattoo that's meaningless and I'm going to regret it. Um, and I really wanted to construct something on my own time that kind of came to me in my own way of like, dude, I really want to have that as a, as a permanent part of my body. Um, and so what I decided to do, because my family is such a unique thing for me, is I decided to take two or three months, maybe even four months to look through these different characters and all this stuff and really res and like if one resonated with me for a certain member, member of my family, that was the one I picked. And so I've gone through the process of it took me about about four and a half months to find uh, seven different characters, eight different characters for every one of my family members. And I'm slowly put piecing them together. And each one represents a part of my family that I, I think about and have their memory and their what they mean to me on now on my body. And it, um, it gives me a little bit of a, yeah. So I, the, the, the artist that I have is, is fantastic. He, he had, he, and the, re, the, the only way that I was going to do this is I wanted to talk to somebody to really access their artistic part of their mind because I don't have squat. Don't have any artistic mm -hmm. value for shit. I well, can draw stick figures. Not true, but I got you. It. I get what you're trying to say. Well, besides the project that we constructed, that was that was the only. I, artistic I thing thought I about bringing about that up, but we won't. Okay, that'll yeah, be just no, for no, you no. and I. Just the name <laughs> of it. <laughs> okay, sick. <laughs> um, but I really wanted to use their artistic mind because I I, I picked the characters. And then everything else has been him of like. So does this he have it already? Background. Do you have it already designed, like the finished product of what your arm will look like when it's done, or you're just it's like I want this character. Okay, now I want this character. Let's find a way to blend it with the characters we already have on our arm. Yeah, the only thing I gave him is is, is pictures of the characters. What do you got on there? So I got um, Mama from Tarzan. I got Scrooge McDuck. I got Tweety Bird. I got Groot. And then I got uh, Popeye, and I still have three more characters to put on there. Whoa. And so what he's doing is I gave him a picture, and this is kind of what the picture looked like, is he's going to blend all of this stuff together with the various different pieces, and it's going to like – and what's so phenomenal is that I gave him a picture of Tarzan and the baby, and he saw a single leaf in the background. Like this is – he saw this. I don't know if you can see. He saw this in the background of the picture that I gave him, and he created this all from just drawing. He drew it himself. Oh, that's cool. And he and he, he he created this as a background as a as a structure for this tattoo, and so then he will mesh this all through. Like in the clouds, he he created those, and that's going to mesh into the bottom of this tattoo, and then when it goes into the bicep, it's going to wrap around him, and this is going to shift into this, and shit, it's going to all blend into that, um, and, and all construction according to him. TJ, last thing here, keep rolling that sleeve up. There is a small group of people who. I know right now are just their mouth is watering because all they want is to see your armpit. Do you mind just giving the people what they might want from this podcast? No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Come on, TJ. Show us your no. armpit, bro. No, the day that I started OnlyFans and we do this together, then that's when the day that they can see my armpit. Where did that dude? I mean, maybe like, I'm guessing maybe some people don't know, but like what, ha this is old. Like we don't need it. It's not, a, I think it's just hilarious that like, a, a viral photo of your armpit or your photo of your armpit went like viral and people just like you got like a billion followers because people love your armpit so much yeah that's yeah that's exactly what happened during the olympics one of the pictures went viral in a, in a certain country and i gained fifty-seven thousand followers in one match because of my right, it sounds like a bit of a tubby, touchy subject i apologize for bringing it up you don't need to show your armpit dude look at me just hoeing you around dude i'm sorry i'm about to call you my fam well you know what that's enough dude i i uh
I love you, buddy. Now I'm happy we can end on kind of an awkward note. Um, we, we finally found the line in our relationship. And honestly, that I, I feel some comfort in that, dude. I truly do. No, I love you so much, dude. I, I super appreciate your time. I think this was like really amazing. And I actually felt like I learned, even though you and I became so close um, this last year, I, learned, I feel like I learned so much about you. I also feel like I learned a lot about you right now. So that's pretty cool for me. Yeah, buddy. I love you too. Thank you for having me. Yeah, buddy. All right. That's it, dude. I love you. Um, stay cold. <laughs>